Um, <laughs> I just realized I'm looking at me. This is ridiculous. That's not the way around this should go. Idiot. Gosh. <laughs> Some things you can't get right. I'm supposed to be able to see what I'm doing. So welcome to this Real Life Guitars video and welcome especially to Andy and uh, his grandson, Zach, who put together this parts caster, Dave Gilmore style Strat. And I have to tell you, you got me on Maple Neck Strats because I love them and I love the Dave Gilmore style. And this um, is a really good go at it. Um, it's got a lot going for it. It's got a nice paint job for a home job that's amazing. Uh, it's got good parts. The pickups are amazing. I don't know what they are, but I'll hopefully have a peek under there and see at some point. Um, it's got a, a nice dark looking maple board, gloss board, which which is a good, a nice color. I think it suits this really well. And then you've got a Fender style headstock with a naughty Fender logo on the top. Just as a, a point, an observational point about this, um, if you show, I mean, the kind of thing, if you show this uh, headstock around and about, people get very uptight about it because the argument is that obviously um, somebody, if, if you were, somebody less scrupulous than you were to sell it or put it on the market, somebody um, un, unawares could buy it and thinking it was a fender. Now, yeah, of course, most of us would know it's not, but that's not the point. So people get really sniffy about that, and I can understand partly why. So it's got some, um, I mean, nobody th nobody thinks it's trying to be a fender. You can see, you know, the decals are just barely on. We've got um, actually nice feeling tuners. These are Geica. Um, you know, they're sort of, they're hip shot copies, really, but they feel okay, except there is one that feels really stiff, so I'm a bit worried about that. Um, so we can see that you know there's different sort of finishes on the or different levels of finish here on the back end. Probably this, and I'm guessing, but I imagine this neck was done and then decals put on and lightly sprayed over, which hence the sort of speckling there. Um, an issue this does have is something that a mistake that um, Andy made and, and knew he made at the time, and that is that he drilled well, screwed in the, the uh, neck bolt without drilling either a pilot hole or the correct size pilot hole. So the result is a um, ended up with a, a split, which he's glued back. So that's, you know, a small price to pay. Um, what we've got on here is the neck not fitting quite right. It doesn't look to me like it's on properly. I don't know how well we can see this, but if we sort of zoom up, you can see there's a bit too much of a a gap thing going on around about there. So I want to take this out, um, or take it apart and have a good look and see if there's any improvement we can make. Um, but I have to say I played it um, and it went out of tune immediately. It's got a nice uh, Wilkinson Trem bridge, which I'm wondering if I have got a spare, I think I've got a spare push-in, <laughs> spare push-in thingy. Um, so it should permit me. Uh, this doesn't seem to fit in here. It could be the bit things done up too much, but anyway, at least I can test it out. Um, he wants to. He's leaving it in down only mode. You can see right now that the the saddles are high up on their back legs a little bit too, but they the action's too high at the moment, um, and the nut is leaning kind of forward, so it's too tall, and the first fret action is too tall, and the nut doesn't really fit the slot very well. So I've got a tusk one here, but we may find that this is a non-standard neck with a non-standard um, nut slot, um, in which case we may have to make one from, uh, make a custom one. Anyway, also doesn't have strap locks, which we can put some on. So overall, it is a nice playing or a lovely sounding guitar. Um, there's a, the, the, you know, the neck is, isn't bad. There's a few little blemishes where it's got some stuff landed on it. Um, I'm not sure if this is something that Andy and Zach fretted themselves, um, but it's got a whoops, it's got a few things which I'll try and polish out if I can just to improve it a little bit. And then we've got a 
string tree that's a bit off the off target there so we'll reposition that a little bit to get that in the right place so uh, overall it's a, a nice looking beastie and i'm kind of keen to get into it onto it and um, let's get a, just a, a view down here sort of long shot really i mean this camera is really mainly sound and close-ups this camera is a sort of wide angle pull away shot the other thing about this is that the uh, the Another reason why I want to take the neck off and explore under here is because the, um, the alignment of the strings goes way off the edge down here. So really, we need we need the whole neck to kind of realign to get the strings in a better position. Uh, could be something to do with this bridge. Now, in a way, when you've got when I have got the strings, I put a, I broke one straight away, and there's a little thing I'll talk about when I come to restring this. I'll talk about the issue with tuning locking tuners because they, they break strings too easily um, and in doing a stretch on the D string it broke immediately because it's been crimped down there anyway I put a spare one on um, and so tempting when you've got when one has all the strings on is to get stuck in and do fret leveling and there's a lot of things about this neck that may change um, but is you know regardless of what I change around here, are we still in a position to do fret leveling? Because it would be great to use the strings for that. Can we do fret leveling? Will anything else we do, like take the neck off, put it back on, will that change anything? Well, no. The fret leveling is is a function of um, how the neck behaves in terms of its curvature and the frets where they sit in under pressure, under load from the strings. And this is under load from a set of tens. So and it doesn't really care that much how. Um, how high the nut slots are in this case that's too high but and the action up here is too high the, the reason I'd want to lower these before doing the leveling is because that would help me to see um, basically make sure that I've got the leveling to where I want it i.e. The, the notes play out so I think a smart move to do here would be to take down the action here um, I would fully anticipate at this point uh, by the way I've done some measurements too um, I know what the heights and stuff are, what it came with, but I'm going to take it down and I'm going to see what the result. Uh, we've got some potentially stripped thing there, which will get a better one and just make sure it's working. Yeah, okay, that's good. Um, yeah, we'll take this right down, and what I'll do is I'll try and do it quickly by guess, mostly guesswork to begin. So, like I say, even though I'm going to make some big changes where I'll take the neck off, put it back on and so on. Uh, it doesn't, it's not bad at all to do the fret leveling now. And it just saves, saves us a, a set of strings that otherwise I'd have to kind of pull from the um, Harley Benton cheap, but nonetheless cost money to buy set of strings. Um, so I'm sort of I'm going by eye at this point for the, the action at the here and I'm just taking everything down a little bit. Got creatures up in the roof space. I hope they're birds of some kind, but I have no idea. They could be murderous fang toothed monsters. Who knows? Right, so let's just do this bit. Now this is probably too low now. Um yeah it's way too low. Mm -mm. But I don't want it too high because I want to push it for the kind of playing action that we should get out of it. So just over 1.5, or ideally on 1.5. Creatures of the roof. Could be, whoops, could be rats. Could be a rat trap, baby. So, just a bit of fiddling around. But you know, I'm, I'm primarily doing this to kick off with the leveling. We'll get that part of it done. Um, it's gonna, well, actually, by the way, what we'll do is we won't assume it needs leveling. We will set the action nice and low here and then we will test play it and we will level should it need leveling come on man I 
This isn't perfect, but it's close. Or it won't be perfect, it will be close. Okay, so, noisy creatures. So fiddly, can drive you a bit nuts sometimes. This. Okay, I think that's nearly right. So let's just get a quick tune off this. This will not tune. Okay, choking out, so we do need to do some leveling. Um, it's not that critical whether or not we take this action down at this end, so I'm going to leave that for a minute. But what is important at that end is whether this nut is going to do the business. Um, uh, what I'll do is I'll try and get a test measurement from the top of this nut, 310. Uh, typical. These are usually three, so that could be a problem. Oh, actually, this is the 341. Okay, good. That will work. Hurrah! Hurrah. Tusk. The best stuff. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn that into an adjustable nut as well when it comes time, but right now we'll ignore it. So, while we're at it, let's get into the, the grungy stuff. Let's get this leveling part done. We Oops, that nut is moving around as well. I forgot that bit. Um, so, so I know this needs um, precision leveling because I can feel here and feel the chokes going on when I try to play it at this action, which is the action I really want to play it at. So I'm going to start by leveling it, and then we can take the strings off, and then we can dismantle the whole thing. But the nice part was, is that the neck will, or the frets, I'm afraid, um, will already be done. And that means I um, don't have to worry about that part about it. And we come back to it. So I was hearing, oh, these are stuck in the slots. Oh, this, this is what I'm warning you about. This is, this is the, it's not just because they're Geico ones. This is what happens with uh, those locking tuners. So I will, at the finish of this, I will stick, I will shove. Actually, these are, these are quite heavy, heavy duty, aren't they? Um, let's see if we can find one. Where can we find? Uh, damn, I'm gonna have to pull apart. Oh, I've got any spares kicking around. I've got loads of those. I've used up those crappy ones. Somewhere, somewhere there were some spares. What is it? An A, well, it's supposed to be. I'm not gonna use this one because they're new. I had some. I had some more crappy ones kicking around. This is supposed to be a, not a 13, idiot. Hmm, gosh, 36. So 42 is not going to be a very good look. Uh, strats need to be long ones, but this will say no. It says Les Paul 9.5 radius. Why did I put 9.5? Nines, it's not 9.5. 
is it 36 I want? That's it, none left there. We're really out of them, aren't we? We are just like totally out of strings. Oh, ukulele strings, they can just go straight in the bin. And those can go in there. Alright, this was an extra heavy, wasn't it? That's why. So that's no good. I'm gonna have to go. And oh, no, maybe, 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 maybe. No! A spare nine. Blimey, I'm gonna keep that. I'll just chuck it on the floor. Obviously, that'll be a useful place to put it. Right, we've got. That's empty, nothing in there. Alright, we've got 36, that will do. Give me the 36. Fourth, fifth, and this spare top E, and I'm going to write E on it because that's a spare nine. They are like a bit rare, and they always break. So yeah, this this is the this is the consequence of the locking tuners of any caliber actually, or pretty much of any caliber. Um, think about it, the tuner grips the string by sheer brute force okay um, and so as a result it holds it there by crimping it and a lot of people quite understandably when they get their locking tuner they think well the whole point of this is that I can just pull the string through lock, lock it down tune and your job's done and there's as little string as is possible going around the post and that seems like a positive however if, that, if you do that, what happens is you basically crimp the string at its taut point, right? So let's push this through again. So while we're here, let's just focus in on this. It's important to make this point because this is to save you money and time. Okay, can I do this? Yay, look at that. Right. So typically what you think you want to do with a locking tuner is to pull it all the way through like that and away you go right um, if you do that you're crimping it let's let's even put a color on it right if you do that you're crimping it basically let's see if I can do this there with a the rubbish color you can't see it so you're crimping it there and it cuts into it right um, and so basically when you undo this um, this side of the crimp eventually breaks Ching, the string comes off like it just did so what I recommend you do if you want to ever stand the chance of um, being able to slack the strings off or even slack them off a little bit so I'm just doing this because this is grabbing the string like no one's business <laughs> um, okay so if you um, if you want to have a a string or use the locking tuners in a way that doesn't do that to the string my recommendation is you pull all the way through right pull it all the way through and then start off on a point like the fret and grab it a sort of thumbnail width back then lock it and actually don't lock it as hard as you probably would have done okay then when you lock it you see how the what would have been the previous crimp point is now back and it will get wound on so we wind it on, right, and you go, well, that's a shame because didn't we just pay for a locking, this is very stiff, this tuner, didn't we pay for a, a you know, a locking, um, locking tuner so we didn't have to do that? Well, technically, yes, but you want to give yourself a bit of leeway, right, so now what I can do, because I've got that little bit of slack, I can undo it again, right, and if I'm worried about this bit still being likely to break, Right, the next time, I'll show you exactly, let's say I was forced to undo it, okay, and uh, I looked at this and I could see in there, I don't know if you can actually see very well now, there's a crimp point, right? And what, it, what I can now do is, if I want to re-thread it, I can move the crimp point all the way through. Obviously, I can't do it too many times, but I've pushed the, the damage point all the way through, tighten it up this time, lift that up so it's not scrape. Um, and this time we can cut off the bit that was previously crimped and now we've got a fresh bit of string to pull on. Now obviously this time that's now got no extra string wind on and it's going to be 
um, you won't tolerate being undone, but give yourself at least one go at it. So that's my advice, and and you know don't don't be feel bad that the uh, you know, it's defeating the object of a locking tuner because it, it's still quicker, and you get a second go at it. And there's many times you might find you need to select the strings off to make some adjustment, and this gives you the freedom to do it or the chance to do it. Whereas if you don't go straight through that first go, this thing will be snapping on you even as so much as look at it. Um, You'll be wondering why. So that's, that's two strings I've broken on here already because of that. So now we've got the guitar under tension. We know that it's struggling to bend. We know that it's got a lot of fret slap here. So now I'm going to get with the fret leveling process right from the offset. And sometimes there, there will be a case for doing things in a different order. Sometimes I like to just get straight in and take the whole guitar to bits and we come back and do the leveling later on, but in this case it makes some sense to kick off with that. Um, oh, the thing I didn't check on this, by the way, is what the relief in the neck is currently doing. And uh, It's a tiny bit of relief, um, not a lot. And that's okay, it, it should work with very little but a tiny bit of relief. What, we, what it won't work very well at is none relief, you know, um, so that's what we kind of start out not wanting we, we need some some relief and it's uh it's interesting that quite a, quite often i get asked how much relief and it's it really is a personal preference but from a playing sci science or common sense physics standpoint actually there's hardly any curve in that at all uh, from a common sense standpoint if you have no relief at all if your neck is dead flat there's a very good chance that the notes down here won't play because the frets are in getting in the way of the um, the string. Um, so what we what we want is a little bit of relief, and I always use the slightly kind of goofy looking skipping rope analogy, so that if you think of two people holding a, a skipping rope and doing playing spin the rope between them, um, you'll notice that the skipping rope spins most at its center point. It describes a bigger arc or the string makes a bigger circle as it travels at the center point. Um, and that means that the, str the string needs more room to spin when you're making a guitar or setting up a guitar. So it, it, it helps you have to have more room than less, uh, than none at all, but it, it, equally, See this, this is very little room. It's tall, that's good now. Um, I might be tempted, since we go carry on as we mean to carry on, let's put a tiny bit more relief into this neck. So we'll, s we'll back it off counterclockwise, just a tiny fraction, and that will um, give us should give us a little, yeah, a little tiny bit more relief. Proves that note down there. Okay, so that's the that's the sort of guide principle about relief. Um, but as far as an absolute, there is no absolute, and my recommendation is always experiment with it. You can't harm your guitar by turning the truss rod. And I'm so fed up of reading pin people's opinions in forums that frighten people off adjusting their truss rods. I think sometimes it's uh, it's luthiers or guitar techs who don't want people doing their work are quite happy to perpetuate this myth that you know an ordinary person touching their own truss rod will go to hell. No, you know what I mean. We'll end up damaging the neck. See, this is just, this is just ridiculous. I needed an extra uh, string to do this, but I've already leveled that. But I'll put another string on because, okay. 
I'm not going to I'm not going to get annoyed because this is expendable strings, right? But you see with that, three strings I've broken on this guitar already. And now it's no it's it's only cheap, but it's you know that that that's cost me uh the the one I was hoping to keep spare now because I want to level this with the tension the, the same as playing. So it it's not so good to have a string missing. So this is the this is the downside of the locking tuners and you saw that that broke at the top end um, primarily because I bent the string and put it under a bit of pressure um, and it's got it's still got a string wound around there now I'm going to have to <sighs> dig it off so yeah that's where <laughs> that's where my miftness comes from and, and when somebody has to dig off broken bits of string like this too you're also in the chance there is much more likelihood of um, damage occurring to your finish and stuff because this is not an easy thing to dig off, dig out um, snapped off strings. You see this? And that's really tight. There we go. So, for all kinds of reasons, the less breaking we get, the better. Now, trust me, if you stick to the method I showed, you will not have strings breaking. The, re the reason they're breaking right now is because they, when I bend them, all the weight is being put on the crimped, flawed piece of string. When we do this next, like I'm going to do now, and we put on a kind of, a little bit, a fair bit now, but I'd rather have more than less, frankly. So I'm doing up the locking thing, not very tightly, and I'm going to just wind this on. Um, when we do it this way, you just don't break so many strings. Um, and I, I think it just makes good sense, really. And it, like I said, it also gives you the chance to go back. Now that's a nine, so it's not really pulling quite as much, only a fraction less loading than the ten would be. But anyway, so that was. That was me trying. Jesus, I give up. That's just broken that one. <laughs> Has it broken it or is it just let it go? Okay, that might have just let it go. It may have been partly my. I mean, this is what I also don't like about locking tuners, by the way, is you tell me how, how much is enough. You either tighten them up so much that you break them. And then they break as soon as you try to bend them, as you just seen me do a minute ago. Or, in order to try and avoid breaking them, you don't tie them up or tighten them up enough. And this came off as that one just did. So now I'm going to have to tighten it a little bit more, um, which is an unknown. It's very gritty. This screw thread, by the way. Um, Kaiker are, are a very budget Chinese brand, um, but hey. Right, so now I'm going to redo it. I've still got a bit to wind on because I want to stick to the original thing, but this doesn't feel very secure at all. I have to say, this may be, this may be, no, it's not going to, it's pulling right through. That's as tight as I can do it with my finger. That's terrible. That's really lousy. Um, ooh, ooh, ooh. This, I think this is a, this is a non-starter, I'm afraid, these tuners. Oh, no, it's not doing it. Okay, so look, there's your there's your problem. This is your cheap, your cheap tuners. I'm afraid. I um, okay. So they look good, but it's it's now we're in a quandary now because this as soon as I push it, it breaks. Um, if it's trying to lock it, it's I can't tighten it up enough to lock it, and it feels crunchy. Uh, I'll try it one more time with a 10. I've got a spare 10. It's usually the, the low string that I've taken out. Oh no, look, there's a spare, spare, another spare one. I'll try and this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to just wrap it on fully round because I need to get this job done. Um, but, and I, I think what I would recommend, Andy, and Zach, um, is, oh wait, there you are. Um, I recommend that you don't trust these locking tuners anyway um, because then they're, they're not really very good quality. Um, they're, they're handsome lookers, but 
they're a kind of poor man's hip shots. There, there, there are problems with most. Jesus! Oh, I hate those sharp things. Please don't leave sharp things. <sighs> no, no, don't upset Uncle Sam. I'm trying to help you here. You don't need to be drawing blood. I call that the uh, string wasps. Okay, so this thing, for some reason, this really doesn't want to let, right, struggling to let me get the string through. So this time, I'm gonna take back a whole fret's worth, because I need, I need, I don't like the sound of that. I need the standard full holding, string holding capability, so I don't care what it costs in terms of wrap around the post. It's, it's getting done this way. I want the string to stay in place. This feels very stiff, this tuner. Okay, so that's got extra windings. Three strings, is that three or four? I can't remember that. Right, what I was trying to do is we needed to have these working. Okay, that tells me that it's, it's choking out as we go across to the G track, and this is where we do the G track. So what I'm doing is I'm leveling the frets in six tracks from the E track down to the, the G track. And what I'm doing, how I'm leveling it, is with an unusual, or well, less common, not very common method, but I've been using it now for six or seven years non-stop, and I've done thousands of setups this way, and it's an adjustable leveling beam. And what I'm able to do is, I, as you can see, I'm leveling with the neck under load. And the reason why that's a more efficient way of doing it is because it's slightly more accurate for a start, because the neck changes shape when you load it longitudinally when it's under compression from the strings. Having it flat, like most people do when they do the fret leveling, doesn't reproduce the effects of that longitudinal compression. So when you have it flat, it's all at rest. Even if you have a jig that bends the neck into the same shape, it's still not pushing it, squeezing it that way, which this is. So I tune, as you saw just then, I tune this tool to the curve of the neck when it's under load. And then I use this tool to level out the frets in that playing configuration. And it tells me very quickly where the high ones are and what's playing well and what isn't. Um, and it confirms usually what I can feel at the beginning. Um, the other reason, one of the principal reasons I do it this way is because, because the strings are on, right? There you go. We've got, the, uh, we've got all the notes. Because, um, I'm just going to do this B again, slightly. Because the strings are on, as you could hear, I could hear the, the exact moment where the choked bend clears up because I've leveled the buckled, crumpled frets as a result of this longitudinal compression. So I clear up that moment, or clear up that problem, and I can hear it because the strings are attached. Now, with any other leveling method, the strings are off, so you don't know, and all you can do is use a method that levels, um, I suppose you could call it absolutely, it just it just basically sets out to make an absolute level. Um, and in doing so, you take more material off the frets than you need to. That's why I'm, a, that's primarily why I like this method. Um, it, the, the, the obvious thing about fret leveling, or relatively straightforward thing about fret leveling, as is doing here, is it's, it's, its first purpose is that it's evening out any frets that are sticking up a little bit out of sequence as a result of this bending, compressing business and the fact that they may have been laid or pressed in slightly high or low. Um, this is taking care of that. But the other thing about this um, method, which I didn't really understand fully until about a year ago, is that it takes care of another major problem that no other method I know takes care of, and that is what I call fret slap. Now, fret slap is this. 
that slap, it's, it's the string hitting the frets everywhere along the neck. So that's different from fret buzz. Fret buzz is, it's just a term, you know, definition I, I stick to because it makes sense. But fret buzz is when you have a low or a high fret in the sequence of frets causing the, uh, the fretted note to buzz. But that usually only occurs in one or two places along the neck and you can tell when you get there. Fret slap is that buzzing sound you tend to get everywhere up and down the same, the same string. And it doesn't seem to get better or worse in one position or another. So it's consistent all the way through. Now, that turns out to be caused by there not being enough room, as I mentioned at the beginning, for the strings to rotate freely um, in that kind of spinning rope, skipping rope type of thing. But the nice thing about this, this fret leveling method is that because the file is very slightly curved, when you have a fret slap, you can either give the strings more room by curving the neck more, but if you don't want to curve the neck more, or you're at the sort of ideal curve, then what you find is that this tool can gently scallop, scallop out a little bit more room for the strings and it reduces the amount of slap. Still a little bit there. And that still could be partly due to the fact this is still incredibly flat. But um, it's what gets you out of the last bit of trouble um, when you've got the just about the right neck relief um, but you haven't got, uh, you're still getting a bit of fret slap. And when we're at that stage, there you go, that's about right. When you're at that stage, this will just fix that. And I'm going to just double check the calibration and level this, this um, what do I call it? This, uh, track again. So anyway, that's why I used this method and not the conventional methods. Um, I've become quite a fan of it. It's very delicate and sensitive, but it's very elegant. And it, it's amazing at telling you what's going on with the neck as well. And this thing will pick up um, undulations in the neck that you can't possibly see with your naked eye. And I really like it for that. So when I get to a bit, an area where I know there's some fret slap, what I really want to do is I want to let this thing do its work without pressing the ends or flattening it out in any way. This is quite a stiff truss rod, um, so you'll probably notice that I'm going to use this with just uh, holding it in the middle. And I want the curve to work its way into this into these frets. So I'm using kind of side to side repetitions more than I'm using any gravity or downward force. So I'm just trying to use its curve as much as possible. And you can see it's, it's got a bit taking a bit out of the middle there, which is probably what, where the, the slap is coming in. What I'm doing there, by the way, is just brushing the dust out. Much better, hear that? That's the miracle of it. That's how much difference that makes. That's why I love this method. Now we're going to do to the same here. Um, there's no other method that would do that because if you had the neck totally straight and you just leveled it with a flat leveling beam or yeah, a short, you know, a flat leveling beam, what would happen is you then put it under load like this. Um, the thing would curve and you still wouldn't have the nice curve built into it. Um, it wouldn't it wouldn't cure the slap it would still be there um, so again I'm gonna do this end now with as much delicate not downward pressure just willing the tool to work right to the edge sometimes it's you have to hold it a little bit to keep it on track but I want it to do its work in the middle of the neck I want it to just impose this ideal curve into the middle of the neck. And the reason I, the reason it's important that it does this is because the truss rod curve is 
an idealized curve compared to the see look, it's, it's, it's congested in the middle this this truss rod curve is an idealized curve where whereas when you put this neck under load the neck itself is un, is imperfect it's uneven Tiny little bit, but it's nearly gone. I'll do a little bit more. And this time I'm going to concentrate a little bit on this end where I heard it a little bit more. So let's keep it on track. And I suppose you could say I'm just putting a little bit more weight on this end. And this is where it comes into experience and that sort of thing you can't really describe. It's just the touchy feely part of it. Um, you sort of know when you need to lean on it a little bit and you, you know when you, you, you don't want to lean on it because you have to be aware that leaning on it slightly flattens out the bar um, less than many of the truss rods I've used because that's quite a stiff one but you know, if you're using a, 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 a more regular one like this one that came out of the Squire <coughs> strap like this one which I use, this one goes even flatter than the other one does, um, but that one is is a uh, is not stiff. So it bends more easily. A little bit still there. I do. That's quite low. Let me just double check this. Hmm, that's too low. That should be 1.5. I can see from here it's below. Anyway, that's only a tiny, tiny adjustment. But when you're working with very low action, you um, you have to it, it, even the tiniest amount makes a big difference. time at this end. Um, when I go back and do something I calibrate it again before I do anything so I've moved the, the stiffness or the shape of the curve around in the last few minutes so I go back and make sure it's mimicking the curve described by these three points. Now that's what I meant by ideal curve versus, um, versus the actual curve this is an ideal curve because it's a curve produced in a smoothly bending bar based on three sample points, just three mathematical points. And that's kind of, those three points are, inverted commas, mapping a real curve, which isn't perfect. It's, it's got humps and bumps, as I said. So when you, when you uh, map, when you map this imperfect curve with this more perfectly bending truss rod, um, it allows the truss rod to, in inverted commas, impose itself back down on the imperfections, which is actually quite useful, is what I guess I was getting at. So that's the, that's why the method tends to be pretty effective. Good. Of course, we've got no nothing in tune anymore. Um, that's so stiff. That key. Hmm. 
Right, okay, I'm going to stop there. That's the, that's the fret leveling part of it. Um, so what I'm going to do at this point in the game is I'm going to take off. Uh, genuinely, I think you're going to struggle with these tuners. They are, um, they are very stiff. Uh, they, you know, they grind or lock up as you go around. Like this one, it's grinding. It's the gears are. It's like the gears want to chew themselves to pieces. I wouldn't be surprised if they do actually. So I would. I would recommend considering um, something else. And that maybe I mean they're nice looking. I know that, but there's nothing quite as bad as a, um, a tuners that. Oh, look at this. This doesn't want to go past that point. <laughs> tuners that fight you or seem like they're going to bite their own cog wheel, cog teeth off, you know. Um, and there's nothing you can do, obviously. There you go. Look, the bee finally broke its own free will. <sighs> Honestly. And this one, the E is tightening up now. <sighs> oh, and that went, that made a snapping noise <laughs> undoing it. Bite crunch noise. It's still working, but is it still working? No, it's died. That's sheared. There you go. Ugh. <laughs> no, that's that's completely died. Ah, there you go. Oh, that's a curved. That's curved. Is that curved? No, I don't think it is. Right, that's good. But anyway, look, we've got a problem now. You need a new set of tuners. Sorry, but that's exactly what these do. They're so badly made. They've that's that's sheared because it's chewed its own cogs up. Yeah. Sorry. Don't want to be the bringer of bad news, but there's no fixing that. It's just cheap, cheap stuff. I'm afraid. I like you know. I like cheap stuff where you can get away with it. And there's some things like certain bridge pieces and stuff where you know it's just a piece of metal and there's nothing massively complex or clever about it. And in those sort of situations, um, you can really you know you can work with that. Um, and I've used a few inexpensive Geica or Music Lily bridges um, in my time, but. Um, you have to be absolutely clear that the thing you're using is, um, you know, not a priority piece. So I'm going to undo these because that's, that's sheared off. I'm going to take it apart if I can and um, see what broke. Uh, I'm afraid it's a no-go. Um, I don't know what we can see inside of this. That actually stopped turning the post. There you go. It has literally given up the ghost. I don't think there's anything we can actually do. Ooh. Ugh. Grind is completely trashed the gears up. Let me get a close close up of that. That's I'm afraid that's what that's what happens with these things. I think I just switched off. What the hell is going on? Sorry about this, I seem to have switched off my video. Right, let's get a close up of this. This is pretty depressingly grim. There you go. I think, unless I'm mistaken, I think that's your that's where the gears have gone. See that? Yep, snapped off. So consequently, when you turn this, there you are, a little bit of brass for your money. That's your Geica, I'm afraid. Sorry about that, Andy. Sorry, Zach. It's, it's defunct, so we're going to have to get some more in. Uh, right, so while I'm here, Oh, shut the wrong sound coming in. Sorry. Everything AWOL now because I just took that out. Let's get this back together. 
without shutting it down. Please work. Thank you. Right, I don't know how much we lost before, but the bad news is we've we've encountered the end of the end of this tuna. Um, that's all there is to say. It's, it's just it's just chewed its own cogs, um, and that's because it's crap budget quality. I'm afraid it's not actually. You know what? It's not even budget quality. It's below that. Um, a tuner. You you can you can tune your guitar and it will stay in tune with any kind of basic tuner, right? And this is an annoying part. If if you had absolutely bog standard pressed steel tuners that you'd get on an old Squire Bullet or something, they would work perfectly well on this. It's those those are simple but even they are well enough made. The problem with these is that they're not even that good. They're, they're all about the look of the thing. So, you know, we, we get suckered into the fact they look nice and they look like the ones we know work really well. For example, the hip shots, these, I think these are probably copy, copying hip shots. So we've got the B string trapped in here as well from where it broke. <sighs> Yuck. Anyway, um, yeah, so, you know, they look like the sort of hip shotty things that they are copying. I, I think, by the way, you'll, there's a couple of these have got, they're grinding as well. So there's a couple more here that are probably also starting to, to screw the, screw the cogs. But I'm not sure, it's, it's not really even worth taking them apart, not unless you want to send them back to Geica for a refund or whoever the seller was on the Amazon. But this is a shame because it's it's now it's put a stop. I, I was I could have had this done today, but this is, you know, it's increased the cost to you. Um, but, you know, you could see from, from the, m the minute we started this, I wasn't happy with these tuners. Um, and not just, not from any, you know, snotty, um, perspective just it was there, there was clearly something wrong with them from the outset um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill this hole because it's in the wrong place and then we'll move a bit later on we'll move the um, thing across the, the string tree it's only it's kind of a, a mixture it's, it's a tiny bit functional but it's mostly um, cosmetic because it looks it looks a bit it's a shame you know it's got a nice looking neck and then then sort of strings end up going off sideways which is a pity so let's let's get this um, filled <laughs> I just threw both bits away I only wanted to throw one bit away I'm only supposed to blow the your doors off All right so for the time being I'll just get some glue on here we'll put it on there and We'll get a little hammer, just to tap it down and snip it off, and then we'll let it dry at its own, its own pace, and then we'll trim it back nice and flush. Okay, so we don't even worry about that for now. Come back to that later. Um, yeah, right. So for a replacement, these are these operating on a forty-five degree angle so I suggest some something like uh, well you know but budget but effective you want a sort of 19 to 1 um, gearing ratio um, no less really um, I think these were about 15 to 1 because they're just a bit crap masquerading as good quality ones but so we want a, a 19 to 1 uh, minimum but you can get those for about 30 quid or perhaps a little bit less so that's that out of the way here we have what will become our new nut and it's just the right size which is great we'll need to just sand it down a very tiny fraction so i'm kind of doing that bit while we're i'm just well not i'm just tidying up the slot a little bit so that we've got a clean nut slot for this to go in we don't want anything in the way and then really the the bit to just get this to fit is just to take down the sort of sharp edges on the nut to begin with. I'm going to end up 
making this adjustable because it's a really excellent way of getting the right first fret action and it's a trademark of my setups as well. So here we have uh, something that's just a tad too tall at the moment so we'll just take it down a little bit more not tall sorry um, a little bit too fat front to back and what we want to be able to do is to get it in it's almost right um, we have to make sure that the the glue doesn't get stuck in these corners and that if the corners aren't dead straight or there's anything caught in them you can get real the thing can struggle to the nut can struggle to sit cleanly in the gap so I'm just trying to do my best to clean out previous glue and finish or whatever else gets caught in there. I don't know what you can see exactly. We want, we want to get the cleanest slot possible and that's almost there. Better push it all the way through now before it gets stuck. Now we're almost at the sort of thickness we want it so I'm going to be very careful not to over sand it at this point because we don't want it wobbling, that's the last thing. So when we get down to about the right thing, that's pretty snug. Um, again, a tiny bit more room to go down, particularly we take the corner. Sometimes there's a little lip on the back side of these nuts as well. Back side of the nuts, what do you want about? There we go. So I deliberately ordered this one to get as close as possible to the spacing of the original. Um, which it is, um, but we I had to do that. I had to have it a little bit wider, wider, yeah, wider this way. So we'll tidy that extra width out the way, but the spacing's still good, um, and it's going to be more coming off the base end than no, actually it might just about be half and half. Well, but we'll take care of that. So you can see that this fits. It's way too tall at the moment. Um, the mm, the the downside of this, uh, fitting an adjustable nut, it might not actually be adjustable by the time we get done because the adjustable nut does require a certain minimum depth of uh, slot to work. Um, if it's not deep enough, then it's difficult to do because the nut has to sit down and be allowed to come up a little bit um, so it may be the case that if this is going to stay as shallow as this we may be better off going with a fixed nut which is probably the best solution um, the other thing is when the nuts too tall like this or still as tall as this um, it's quite easy for it to get th so that it thickens up at one end and not the other so it's better to hold back from over sanding it in this thickness direction until we've got it down to the right height so that will be enough for now that's fitting in pretty well in the slot um, if I measure the nut slot on here it's 2.59 well well should still work should still work. Well, okay, yeah, we can still do adjustable. That's just about enough. Right, but we'll put it to one side at, at the moment, keep it safe. Okay, so I think the next thing to do, we'll have to have a conversation with, with Andy now about the um, tuners, but I think what we'll now do is take off the neck and see what lives under there. I think that will be it for tonight, really. Um, ouch. I didn't even notice this before. What went through there? Whew. Didn't even see that. <laughs> um, that's a hole all the way through from the electrics cabinet. Cabinet? Cavity. Right, let's, let's remove... Let's remove the neck and see what we've got. Now, 
thing is, when I started this, what I was thinking of is it may be that if we get this to fit better a bit later on, um, then what we might find is that the action's all wrong at this end. But that doesn't really have a, an effect on on the, um, ooh, that's painful. That's got, the crack went through both holes. X. Well, one of the problems with this is that that's now not flat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a piece of green tape on here. I'm going to mark the front edge of the pocket and see what we can send back to um, basically flatten off because you really more than anything else you want the um, you want this neck pocket to be properly flat so I'm going to put this back in here it's quite a stiff fit for a start so there's a risk of bits of flaking finish. Uh, this is very tight actually, it's uncomfortably so, well, hmm, ishy. Right, so what I'm going to do is just, I don't know how well you can see this, I'm just going to draw the mark off the front of the pocket on this green thing. Um, and then I'm going to cut just behind that across here and Remove that. So basically, that area there I want to flatten if possible. That's the bit that really matters. Um, and if it's not flat now, it's going to be causing that gap that I saw. Uh, and the way to do it, which is great, is to use a very flat piece like this. And so we get the we get the um, whole piece. And you can see it's starting to take. It's having a go straight away at the high ridge on that side and it's really just so that we can end up with um, a flat heel as much as is humanly possible so I'm kind of letting the this flat piece do the work and I'm using my guideline to stop me going too far so you can you can still see that um, that that bit's holding up, it's sitting up high. So it's. I'm just trying to. I really just more than anything, I want to make sure that this takes this down, flattens it out, but we keep everything nice and flat too. And it won't take too long to get there. It also shows me that the edge of this neck is um, not flat too, it's curled over. So it would probably sit better by the time it's completely flat all the way across. So um, so the good thing about using a block is it really does keep it as straight as it possibly can be. Now this, of course, is taking a very small amount of height, but it's only a tiny amount. And now what we're getting is a flat heel there, regardless of what it looks like out here. Wow, there's a lot of glue and stuff in there too. Um, yeah, we're getting a, a flat heel. And now this will sit much better, although there's still a little gap here, which shows me, like I say, that it rolls off a bit over the edge. Um, we can continue to address that by using the flatness of the block. It may just be that it, 
have to take a judgment call, you know, to get this sharp to the edge, i.e. to undo the rounded bits here, is probably not worth it for the amount we'd have to take off. So in this case, it's probably better to, as long as we're confident that we've got the, that little sticking up piece now flattened off, uh, be better off to stop at that point certain where you are just check across with a flat surface that's perfect actually so there you go that's just a that's a small amount of tidying up what was a, originally a kind of tilting thing so that will help help that will make a very big difference to helping this sit, sit back tidy on a Friday and um, like I say the slight over thickness of this whole piece here um, is threatening the every time we put it in or out it threatens slightly the um, finish around the top edge there but that's unavoidable so this is now in place we can put the these back in the these back in and we'll get a we'll get a better join now and of course it will have a very small effect on the action which we won't need to worry about until we redo everything a bit later on and then we'll just account for that with changing the bridge saddles. Now, one thing about this, remember that the saddles are quite high up. Um, and if we didn't want that, we would have to we'd have to reduce the height of the fingerboard. So what we were doing there with sanding, not really a problem. Because in a sense, if anything, we probably need that reduction ever so slightly. So I'm being very careful because I know that there's a, f a flawed uh, split re-glued piece of wood there. Now that's now made a wa watertight, an airtight joint that I didn't have before. Mm, feels good. All right, so that little thing has improved that. Um, now this, I'm just going to do something here while we're at it before I close down. Really, um, just want to have a look and see whether I can make any impression on this grime or marks, scratches, scruffs, scuffs, scruffs, scruffs on the finish. Um, this is pretty good stuff. This general purpose thingy. You know what it's called? Paint, finish, polish. It's a, it's an alternative to the stuff I used to buy, the Eterna Shine. So it's not easy to get a lot of kind of purchase into a in between frets like this. But what I'm just looking is to see if I can make any immediate improvements on this, and whether you know it's worth doing this and then putting it through the buffer as well see if it'll actually help us along what I don't want it to do is um, I don't really want to sand it back or anything uh, a buffer might do it if I was going to buff it I'd probably want to buff it now sooner rather than later um, there's a couple of spots there's a little bit of stuff built up down there but I don't think it's really much to write home about and I'm nervous if I get a buffer out, ending up with loads of goo on the um, from the metal from the frets on the the um, mops. So I would prefer to be trying to do it with a bit of elbow grease in, in this way. It's, it's it's only a minor detail. I mean, technically, you you might go at it by, you know, micro mesh papers, going back down the grits and back up to a point where this polishing business would be the finishing touch and it would all work out. But actually, this is this is nearly nearly there. A bit more of this, and I think it would be much more livable with. I'd rather do that than 
put this over the wheel. And I just need to do a bit on the edge now. I can feel where it's scratched. Okay, so um, the next stage while I'm at it, before we stop to go and consult, um, stage right now will be just to do the um, that thing recrowning. So again, I'm, I'm, if you're not confident with your marker pen, um, then you might want to mask off your fingerboard first. Um, he said now, kind of putting himself dangerously on the spot. Um, this, every time I use a marker pen on a finish like this, um, or on a neck like this, I'm terrified, uh, not marker pen, sorry, masking tape, I'm terrified. I've got a sort of post-traumatic trauma of pulling off finish using even low-tack masking tape. And that, that came as a result of um, working on a couple of fenders which seem to have a reputation for uh, the, the finish on certain models just falling right off at the slightest provocation. Um, and lo and behold, it happened to me a few times in a row, which was grim. Um, anyway, so I'm just going to crown these files files, I keep saying that, these frets, just to um, get the, the, sh the shape of them back to a sort of, what do we call it, uh, an arch shape. And of course I have to work a bit harder on the ones where we've done the more levelling, um, which is always the way. And it's this part of the process, if you use this kind of file, it's, it gives you a really good indicator of what you, how much levelling you have done, or sometimes actually not what you've done, but how flat the frets might have been from someone else's work. Um, and this very quickly shows up at this stage now. What I like about this this fretboard, and I, I don't know whether um, Andy and Zach, you, you sprayed this and then fretted it or you bought it ready done. I like the fact that it's um, it's been finished and polished before the frets have been put in, um, which is or, or, weirdly not a way that too many manufacturers do it. It seems to be quite common to put the frets in and then just go straight over the top and you get the finish goes up and up to the sides of the frets looking like a carpet. Um, I suppose it's a quick and easy way for manufacturers to do it that way um, because I know that doing it this way takes a lot more time because you have to you have to spray your material, clean the frets out, uh, sorry the slots out, spray more, clean the, the slots out and then eventually end up with a sanded back gloss fingerboard that you can then buff out before you put the frets in and then of course the, the challenge then is to do all your fret work without doing, making any damage to the, the gloss which is actually a hell of a lot harder proposition than anyone ever imagines in a particularly in a you know an amateur or a home non-commercial workshop so if this was your doing, Andy and, and Zach, I totally take my hat off to because I know for sure how hard it is to do the finish first and then do the uh, fretting afterwards. Okay, so pretty much there. Very nice. Now what I'm gonna do, um, briefly is I'm just going to clean off all of this. I'm going to clean off all of this. That stuff. <laughs> marker pen. Thank you. Clean off the marker pen just using a cloth and this Coleman's fuel which is the kind of cleaning solution which is safe on poly, safe on nitro as well. Um, it's an in inert stuff, but it cleans the, the, the uh, marker pen off very nicely. 
um, and it just gets, gets it mostly cleaned off before we get on to any next stages. bin that one. Oops. Okay, so frets leveled, ready for um, masking off and sanding out. And you can go in the bin. All right, I think that's got to be it for today because because of the tuna issues. Um, I suppose, um, having said that, I suppose I could do the polishing the frets part. When we step back and look at what this needed, more than anything else, this needed a um, this needed the neck pocket looking at and making sure it was secure. And, and I think I've done that with that little flatten out and taking care of that part of it. Um, it needed for a good setup. It needed a new nut, which we're going to be on have on the go, and it needs. The, um, the frets leveling so that we can play it with a low, nice low action that's going to stay in tune next to the nut as well. So I think we're, we're kind of there with most of that, but there will be a pause for the discussion of new tuners. Um, so I'm just giving this a clean over. It'll get dusty again when I sand out the frets. Um, I suppose we could do a couple of a couple more things. What is the time? Let's check. Mm -hmm. Let's check in my pocket. Time is nearly time. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's see what the deal is on the nut because having the nut ready to go will be an important part of the deal. So, what I've, I've done a few of these tonight anyway for someone else. So what I do is I'm just going to draw my nut slot and I'm going to measure the nut. So uh, the nut slot came in at zero, please. 258, 277, 256. Let's call it 2.6, 2. 2. just kind of close enough. So we know we've got 2.6. We know we've got uh, a height to the base of the notch of 4.96 on the base end, and can't ever get quite as tightly in there, but 5.4, 5.4 on the treble end, and 4, 5, so 5.4 and 5 um, here. Okay, and then we have to calculate the height of our frets, which is a bit of an, a, a, an estimate. And I think these are all coming in at about one mil maximum. So they're not tall. 95, but let's call it one. So we've got a fret height of one. We've got 2.6 of uh, slot, and we've got 5.4 and five on the nut. So we need a height of, for the base of the slot, we need the height of the fret. If we're going to make an adjustable, we want it to sit on top of the first fret. So we need, we need 3.6 as our notch height at rest. And then we'll wind it up from there to get the first fret action. So that's clearly different uh, than the 5 and the 5.4. So on this end, that's going to be minus 1.4, and on this end, it's going to be minus 1.8. So it's a slightly, a slight gradient. Now, if we were to mark up 1.4 and 1.8, it's a bit of a, a tiny, hard to draw gap between the two. But what did we say at treble end? Uh, slightly higher, so 1.4 at treble end. Let's see if we can get anything sharp enough to draw that. Pencil. Let's try it. Okay, treble end. Treble end 1.8. Again, this is, you know, not exactly super scientific. And then we're going to go 1.4. The other end 
which is almost the same but just a fraction less and actually marking that up with a pencil is a little bit hopeful frankly so now I'm going to try and draw a line in pen and I'm expecting to have a slight gradient slope which I think will just do and that's about it okay so that is what I need to take off but once I've done it then I'm going to want to have my two uh, I want 28 mils apart I've done four of these today uh, 28 mils I've been basically making adjustable strat style nuts for a customer so I, I'm spacing them at 28 millimeters and what I would go is 28 mils apart and that one there and that one there and that's my holes for the that thing <laughs> adjustable grub screws so so the interesting bit is to now file this down and sometimes what I do at this point if I can do it carefully enough I like to sort of scribe with some marker pen permanent marker that stuff the bit to remove onto there and it, it's a sort of it's not exactly scientific but that will stay on long enough for me to take it off and then what I'll also do which may or may not be now let's do it now um, I tend to Look, I've even got the drill in the a bit. The bit is in the pillar drill, ready for for doing this. So what I tend to do is get something solid, and I will make an initial mark in each one of these dots. And there's my start point, and I'm, I'm leaning in because it's an angle to begin with, so I want to get it to bite the right place thank you bite in the right place at an angle and then dig it down a little bit so that's all I need to do there and what I also like to do then is to take the appropriate mm. drill bit for the for this job which is this one and just to help this on its way in fact I've, this is a bit blunt this one but it's quite can be quite good to start the hole with a handheld thing um, and if that doesn't work then to do it with a little bit of the drill to begin with just enough basically to get the, the hole started because it's trying to do it on a little bit of a slope and it tends to want to go off sideways if you do it when you, when you do it with the pillar drill um, funny enough you have a bit less control because the pillar drill the bit bends Um, and it tends to want to push out the wrong side so we have to sort of get a good start um, sorry about the noise all right not very sharp these the bits the one I've got in the drill is much better but anyway there's a start point so now it's a matter of taking off this extra material here um, which you could do with uh, you could do with a put it up against a pillar a bobbin sander or I'm going to do it on this short block and I'm going to sort of push down the treble end first because that's got to have most off so I've just pre prejudiced privileged that side with a bit more um, first, um, now I'm going to try and 
keep it forced down in the middle and I'm taking off uh, a mass of material. Now at this point um, as I get a little bit closer to the line I just want to trim so I can see what I've got left to do. See that? Getting towards the line. Now the important bit is about getting the cut so it's perfectly vertical um, and so you have to check where which way the nut has been leaning as you do these sandings. We're on the, we're on the uh, crude grit here so it takes quite a lot off in one go and as we get closer and as I'm, when I think I've got the thing vertical which I'm pretty close to now I can do a little bit more on here to move more material um, and as we get right close to this black line I want to take all of it it's tempting to sort of wimp out but what we want is I want this nut when it goes into the slot I want it to default without this grub screws being wound in at all I want it to default to the strings sitting on the first fret that's its, that's its start point for me. Um, we've also got to do the end a little bit as well to fix the measurement and we know the measurement um, can either take it from there or from here. So I'm just getting all of this little details taken care of. That's 42.2 and this will be quite a bit longer at the moment so I'm going to take about a millimetre off each end. So I'm going to do it, I'm going to try and do it equally um, and I'm using a little radius thing for hand, hand cutting nut ends. It's a, it's, a, it's a little bit clumsy but it's actually a lot better than trying to do it by hand literally. So I mean you can do it like this if you're feeling confident. Take off a bit each end and sort of clear the bulk of it but it's, it's a little bit what do we want? 42.26. Okay, so we're not far off. So we can swap that out for this one. If we want, we can just trim that one a bit, trim that one a bit. Again, check the measurement, nearly there. Now I'm going to just put it back in this radius end thing and just try and tidy up, square up the end as much as possible. Again measure. Do this end. And I'm just making sure that the clearance at either end is the same. The high and low E. Okay. And that's pretty much spot on. Now what we get out of that is a slight um, slightly sharp edge here. So I'm just going to round those off so it's a comfortable end to the nut. So it just doesn't stick into the fingers. Right, and then we can just put it in test for width. Beautiful. Handmade. A little bit more rounding off just to keep it smooth. Okay, now I'm going to concentrate on the Finishing the bottom, which is almost there, I'm just going to do it with this finest of papers that I've got here, which is 240. So I'm just getting right down to the mark now with this 240 grip. And as I say, I'm taking it carefully so I don't put any wobbles in, can't do any damage to in any hurry. Um, and I want this to be leaning in the correct direction now. It's just slightly backed away a little bit. I'm just going to refocus the pressure so it goes in and gets a 90 degree base. It gives us a proper standing nut. That's pretty good. Okay, so that's just about at the size I want it. Um, now looking at this, uh, it's still not seated perfectly well. And I, my slight concern about that is that... I don't want to be thinning the nut out anymore. I want to make sure that the corners of this uh, slot are perfectly square because if, if that's what's holding it from sitting in place, I want to take care of that. 
uh, as opposed to continue sanding the nut um, because you don't want to end up, most of all, you don't want to end up with a, a loose nut, <laughs> if you get what I mean. <sighs> so it's very, very delicate business. Now this is nearly pretty much seated. Now if you're getting near to the point, you can then test this by putting your your um, string over or your blade and you can see this isn't yet touching the first fret so that's still quite a way off let's just double check my measurement well there's still quite a bit showing so let's take a little bit more down I think I wimped out a bit it's quite often the case Sideways, so time to bring it back flat. And when I have to do this, keeping it exactly level or straight, I tend to do the rocking from side to side thing so that I can keep the angle of the piece pretty much dead steady, dead steady, Freddy. Now in a way, with an adjustable nut, you've got a fair bit of leeway because if you overcut, the one thing you have got is the ability to raise the nut up on its feet, which is the whole point of this thing. So um, I'm not going to be too freaked out if um, I go, oh no, I've overcut it by a fraction of a mil. Okay, that's still... Oh, hi. But is that because it's not quite sitting 100% flat? It's hard to tell. So fiddly stuff, I'm afraid. Fiddly stuff, just trying to clean out slots is actually the hardest thing I know when it comes to guitar stuff. The, the slots are an absolute pain. That is dead in, well, it's as in as it's going to be at that end. So sticking up a tiny bit at this end. Yeah, so it is about the hardest thing I know to get these successfully cleaned up and functional. It's incredibly easy to mess up nut slots um, so that they are just too ragged and they don't work. Or That's perfect on that side. It's nearly there on this side. So it feels good, but still a little tall. Now, of course, I've left myself no extra overhang to get this off with. So I have to now carefully get it out. Okay, so at the right depth, it's still too high. So it can uh, runs off the edge of the damn piece. So let's just double check this. Distance we have 3.6, we have 2.6 and 1. That should put this base string onto the first fret, according to my reckoning. He says if that would sit, but that isn't sat all the way in because there's something not quite right about this end of the slot. Just pulling glue and stuff out of there. And then there is, if we need to get the Hosco nut file back in, just to try and make sure it's all leveled out. Not a lot of room to operate this thing. It's a great little file, but frankly, you see how it's very nearly the same, exactly the same size as the slot. So getting a getting it to do anything is quite tricky. So in we go. Flush at that end as near as we can at this end. Not quite flush. That could be because it's still 
slightly standing up or a, a, a rift or a, a hillock in the middle. So you go back in and sort of scrape with a blade to try and keep it as straight as possible. And really we're just taking out any material that's built up and it could be glue, it could be finish, whatever's in there, we want it out. So you can see how much fiddling it takes to get that slot right. But eventually you'll know when you do because it's flush that side and it's still not quite flush this side. Now it is. Whatever happened there, it pushed in. Okay, and what it's showing me is there's a hump in the middle. Uh, and that, I'm afraid, can only be cured by either being able to sand it out with this file, if we can. Um, there's a little hillock in the middle of the whole thing it will never sit flat and it sort of looks nearly flat but it's amazing how how slight it takes to, for it to be off but I think it's probably productive to keep at it I mean if you've got a good blade like this you can scrape backwards and forwards that's quite a, a good way often will help level it down. It's very close indeed. I'm being finicky now. It's spot on that end. And a whiff off this end. Um, again probably a bit more with this. I think there's a I think there's a, a roll off on this end, that's the problem. I think we're gonna have to live with it. There's a curve downwards at this end. You sometimes get that in slots, I don't know why, it just happens, but... So I don't think any amount of more work is going to cure that, so I think we have to live with that. We have to go where this seats comfortably as it's... That's very close, I, mean, I don't know if you can see that. It's very close. I'm being oily finicky. Right, so what we're testing for is at that seating, does this touch the first fret? That's practically on the first fret and the treble side is a bit higher. So it tells me that we could do a little bit more sanding. When you go there, we can lose a bit more on the treble side. Um, stay there. So just kind of putting the, putting the boot on the treble side of the nut. It's sort of sanding all sides, but it's concentrating the pressure on the treble side because that's a little bit on the high side at the moment. Um, come on, where did you go? Thank you. So this blade thing gives me a good look if there's a big gap when I put this across between the first or gap over the first fret it tells me the treble side is still too high. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to revert back to this one now and I'm going to put a bit more force into it. Yeah, I've still got to put it on the drill and get the grub screws drilled, but it'll be worth it. That's why it does cost a little bit when I do this for people. It's not an easy, uh, simple solution. It's worth doing because it's a, it's, it's a tusk nut, 
And the one thing you'll notice that I haven't touched the slots and I'm aiming to do this because I don't want to touch the slots. I want this thing to work with the factory slots as they were intended. And that's the beauty of it for the tuning stability. Now that is starting to feel like we're in the right place now. That is almost touching. So the slightest little bit more and we'll be ready to put the ticket to the drill. Okie dokie. So you see this nut's become quite low to say the least but it's, um, it's going to do the job beautifully well. Okay so final polish out at the bottom drop it in here push it all the way on lovely <laughs> a little test out touching the first fret almost touching the first fret so a tiny bit more I mean that, that's a being extreme it, it actually will work as it is right now but I like I like to start with it touching the first fret if I can that way I know that it's it's at the right place okay now I'm going to go across, I don't know if you can come with me. Oh, you have, have you conked out? You have conked out. You've run out of memory. Do you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to delete the blasted, recently deleted folder, didn't I? Yes, I am slaving over hot guitars. Do you know what? This, this bit about this iPhone absolutely cheeses me off. Hey, do you want to delete your recently empty album? Yes, thank you, delete 69 gigabytes. Now I can get that back. And now I can have it back to do the filming that I was just trying to do. Well, at least we got a close up, didn't we, of the... Hey, I'm back on this one. At least we had a close up of the gnarled gearing. <sighs> Sorry about that. I'll just have to try and connect these up sound wise a bit later on. But I don't know what I'm seeing right now. I don't know what I can see or why. Uh, what's up there? Let's have a look down. You can see my bald, scarred head. That's the worst view anyone's ever seen, but that's all I'm going for right now. You can see what's going on. So, I'm going to place my little nut in the vise. Come along. Here you go. Fire. Get in there. Right. Down, get in, get up, get down, get in, get up, get down. Down, in, up. Right, that's a good grip. Let's have you like that. Right. <sighs> Come stand on my tiptoes. Run! about that it's the worst camera view in the world but hey okay so that <laughs> that has got that out of the way I need to bring these little M2 ones because that's my drop screws that will do this job I need to come down here where you can see what I'm doing oh dear now all I do now is I take the I go from underneath I take my drilled hole and I get my tapping tappy whatever tap it's called and I'm going to tap an M2 hole two M2 holes in this nut the amazing thing about tusk that doesn't work with bone is that tusk will allow you to do it as long as you're gentle and you come to the end of the thing with lo and behold a tapped thread and then be careful and take the piece off 
sorry about this, not a very good view. You've got number one hole tapped, and you come out the other end, and you do the other end. And now we've got a ready-made adjustable tusk nut for this strap. And this means it's going to fit, it's going to be the right height, you can tweak it up and down to the right height. What, what I'm going to show you now, the next bit, is as I put it in, I'm going to use two grub screws with uh, normal pointy ends to identify or tap them down and we'll identify where, the, uh, where this nut sits on the board and then we'll have a start point and then I will hand drill or finger drill two little recesses for the feet to stand in and that takes, uh, spreads the pressure of these little feet and in my experience is the uh, the, the wood, the maple, um, crushes down a little bit to begin with, and then you can just basically, uh, you can, you can, uh, it just, you know, it crushes and then it compacts and it stays where it is. So the first thing I'm going to do with these, I wonder if that's a cup end. I need two sharp ended ones, come on. There it is. Um, sorry about this, it's very fiddly. So in they go, give me two little ends sticking out there. Then I place this into the, that thing, <laughs> the slot, where it's going to sit. So I mark up the ends, make it, make sure it's central to, and I have to move this out of the way, sorry. Not got enough room to operate in a minute. I uh, hope you can see that for a second. So I get this in, into place, which I think is right there. What I'm now going to do is I'm now going to tap with the nylon and nylon, remove, and I've got two little marks on there. And I'm going to use two little whatchamacallums drill bits. I'm going to first of all hand drill this one a little bit. That's blunt as anything. It's not a very good start is it? So I want to just cut a little bit in where those dots are. So I get myself two little dents if you like. I don't want them to be huge. I just want them to be enough to hold the um, that's not the right size. I want them basically to hold the feet still so they don't move. <laughs> so you can see what I'm doing. I'm just turning this with a bit of downward pressure. <laughs> now, basically, if I put that back in now, that would stop it moving because it, it's absolutely fine. What I don't want to do, I don't want to use the sharp-ended um, things because I don't want to give it an excuse to dig further into the wood. So what I'll do is I'll take these same... God, you're supposed to be magnetic. Thank you. I will take these same little feet. I don't know what you can see. I'm ever so sorry. And I'm going to now run these down the sandpaper, sticking out with a little point sticking out a tiny bit. And hold on to them and I'm just using the paper now to scrape the grub screws to a flat and we'll scrape it until it just reaches flush with the um, ideally flush with the base of a nut and I just want to not go too far because I don't want to take too much more uh, tusk off the bottom there but eventually it will come to a, a sort of flush finish Something very close to that, and push it through a little bit more if I need to get it just that last bit flat. That's pretty good. So that then becomes 
flat-bottomed. Um, you know, they, they'll sit on the wood without making so much of a, a hole. Now, I wanted to go a little bit thicker and a little bit wider with this uh, the drilling, hand drilling the little thing, but I haven't. I don't seem to have got the right drill bit that was doing it for me. Um, it's weird because I did have one in here that was just right for it. But it's not working now. Oh, it's gone. Let's try this one, one of these, and this one. That's weird. I seem to have lost the bite of these drill bits. They may be just too old and tired. But the idea is just to have something a little bit bigger, just to widen that footing. It looks like everything I've chosen is not going to work. OK, that one should do. <sighs> right, that's widened it a bit. Okay, happy with that. So what I'll do is, I suppose the only thing is that the good thing about the pointed ones is they'll sit in these slots. You don't have to worry too much about the size of the slot, or the size of the little hole that catches them. But this one, I want it to sit in and not move. And actually, I'm pretty confident that won't. So, so what I'll do to begin with is take this back out to full out. Check either side. So it's a loose nut now. It's not glued in. And we are on, we are definitely on the, uh, we are sitting on the first fret. And we are actually probably still fractionally above it. That's because it's now sitting up a little bit. Tweak this a tiny bit more before I give up. That's a wider one. That's good. You can't see very well. Good. Good. I'm going to do with those. I'm going to do a little bit more with these. Check for the lean, the lean of the machine. That looks good, feels good. Pop this in now. We are as well fitted as it's ever going to be. We know that end's going to sit up a little bit on the base end. The thing is, when you use a adjustable nut, you expect anyway it's going to sit up because you're basically going to be raising it up from there. That's touching. That's not quite touching. Okay. That's good. Gives me a, a bit of an eye, a clear idea. See how much it takes to get this dead right. Now, what I'm noticing as I'm going, uh, that's the interesting bit, as I'm going further into this slot, um, we're coming near the thicker part of the fatter part of the nut. Remember I said that um, when we start off by sanding it or thinning it down, we, uh, we tend to thin one part of it down and the other bit sort of stays fatter. So it gets a bit tightened up. So what I'm doing now is just Loose, uh, just doing a little bit of thicknessing again so that it's uh, okay. still too high. Okay. 
yeah, just making sure that it's thinned out a little bit so that it, it sits, fits the slot without sticking because it, if we then end up with it sticking, it's going to be really hard to, uh, wow, look at the colour of the sun. Yeah, if, it's, if it sticks, uh, it won't go up and down properly when we want it to. So by the time we get to where we want to get to, again, it's thickening up a little bit, so a tiny bit of a slim down here. Make sure it's in and out lovely and smooth. Great. Come on now, let's touch that first fret. Yes, thank you. Touching the first fret, touching the... So that's going to come up a bit. We can still do a tiny bit more. Almost there. Ow. That hurt. Leaning back a fraction too much now. Level that out, please. How are we doing? How are we doing? Okay. I think we should be nigh on there. And again, thickened up a little bit because we've gone down a little bit. So, thinned out. Fit it nicely. Everything touching, touching. Right, that's my, that's where it's going. So that will be it for today. Um, not fitted. Uh, I'll do the, the polishing another day. It's enough fun for today. Sorry about losing the darn video somewhere along the way. What an absolute pain. But now you hopefully you can see what a nice nice thing that is low rise i mean as low as anything and if we absolutely need to once we get the strings on i can pull this off just like that you can see the two little dimples where the feet stand um, we can take it off and try it uh, you know adjust it take a tiny bit more off and it hardly needs to be anything we only need to lift it up just enough to um, do the job oops sorry there you go now while we're at it let's just take a, a wee look at the sunlight jimmy's enjoying it again and out there through the window. The glorious, longest day of the year. The longest day of the year. That really is it. Okay, so Andy and um, Zach, well, there we are for today. I'm gonna hang this up. I don't know what you can see over here. I'm never really taking that much care of looking. I'm gonna hang this up. I think the basics, are in a way, are done now. Neck pocket sorted. Um, we'll check the alignment once we get string, new strings on. Um, we've really found the weakest point in this guitar is these tuners, and they've got to go, I'm afraid. Well, they've gone because they don't, they're broken. Um, next step on the way uh, will be to polish out the frets. That's sort of mechanical work. I'll do that probably off camera because it's boring. Um, and really, miraculously, um, the nut precision stuff is done. And when we come back, it will be... Basically, restring, tweak the neck, lock it back down, um, and we're good to go. Um, oh, and put some strap buttons in. So, whew, sorry about the camera loss along the way there, and uh, I'll see you soon. Should we try again? I really have a lot of confidence in this. I suppose we... Oh, let's try. Sorry about that. I have no idea what was going on. I have to keep coming back now and trying a few more times in a row. There's nothing on this side of the camera that tells me that, and the only way I could do it is have a permanently positioned uh, mirror, but getting a mirror permanently positioned in a particular angle would require a separate stand. Aye, 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 aye. Okay, well, I'll just keep checking. Anyway, so we will have switched over onto the overhead view for a bit and then come back to this one possibly. So here we have the new equipment and um, the reason as you know if you recall that I switched these out is because the cheap uh, I kept saying sorry I kept saying hip shot and they weren't hip shot they were I 
they weren't hip shot they were goto copies um, so they mashed the gears up completely on one of them and it's just an unrecoverable fatal error really um, it's just broken there's no point trying to fix it or, or find another gear from somewhere else it's you know you're starting with substandard stuff it's, it's the they're made by the factories that aliexpress relies on for all its hardware and goods and so they are of a of a particular low quality and that doesn't mean to say that they aren't good those those products aren't you know good for some things but you have to sort of figure out which ones you don't need top quality you know engineering really and some things that you can get away absolutely fine with like certain um, one piece wraparound type bridges or you know some brass adjustable saddle uh, saddles um, nuts and things like that that you can get from those uh, from AliExpress they can be quite acceptable um, but when it comes to something that's uh, you know needs the engineering to be fairly good and an example of that would definitely be the cogs in a tuner then you don't want rubbish in there because it's just going to cost you when you least expect it they're going to break and you're going to be having to stop playing and find some new tuners so I've replaced them with a set of Wilkinson um, what they call easy lock tuners and according to this these should be uh, should line up on the diagonal 45 degree holes but that is not something you can always rely on um, so these are called easy lock tuners and the idea is that they have a they have two holes oh, should we see if the th oh, thing's recording oh look it is they have two holes that are um, through the post at 90 degrees to each other and the idea is you kind of go through one and back out through the other to get an, a locking effect um, or locking effect yeah now these are quite they need just, just pulling on a little bit because they're sitting slightly out of the thing uh, yeah so that they're designed and it's a clever clever Trevor Wilkinson innovation um, honestly I don't use them um, the reason for that is with combined with uh, a limited amount of wire on the posts anyway which is what I always aim for with the method that I use for stringing and combined with a tusk nut and stretched out strings I don't have any tuning problems at all so I don't need this extra locking thing but I buy these because they're basically good quality construction and they uh, I think more importantly they are 19 to 1 gear ratio which means they're smoother and more precise than the ones we've taken off for example um, so the 19 to 1 is, is a sort of minimum gear ratio that I prefer um, and you know they, they served me well these Wilkinson type as far as quality goes so these holes are a, a fraction small I could you know maybe to it's got some sort of built-up finish in there. I probably could have reamed them a little bit, but I'm, instead I'm relying on the nut to pull them in, um, which seems to work okay, whilst turning them a little bit too. Um, yeah. So Wilkinson 19 to 1 tuners, pretty good. Uh, I didn't go with locking in the end because for the reasons... I'm not a great fan of them. I have put them on some of mine in the past, and I'm I'm neither here nor there about it. I, I'm kind of I'm not glad I did, and um, I don't particularly wish I hadn't, um, because mainly because I sort of know I have a deal with myself how to use them so that we don't get strings breaking as soon as I need to. Um, slack them off and that kind of problem that I talked about before that we saw actually repeated on this guitar so when I use locking tuners I still wrap 
wire around the posts. Um, and when I don't use locking tuners, I still wrap a bit of wire around the post in a sort of locking st style. Um, the problem with the only problem with tightening these up when before you position them is they're a little bit harder to move. Okay. Um, yeah. So checking again because I'm paranoid now. Yeah, we're still working. Um, Yes, so 19 to 1 is good, Wilkinson is good. Like I say, I won't even use the easy lock part of the whole deal here. I'll just, uh, I'll just keep it very simple. But I'll show it close up when the time is right in a minute. But they, they performed great for me, these. And I like the mini buttons. They're about, they feel like the right size for this sort of Strat headstock. Um, some of the other tuners that Wilkinson makes for the Strat, I think they're, the knob bits are too big, um, for my liking anyway. Anyhow, so once I've done this, I have got a left-handed nut set up to do. It's unusual to be doing just a nut on a guitar. There was a kind of budget issues going on here, and um, my recommendation to Martin on that case was, look, you know, if you do one thing, um, just do this, get the nut changed, and we'll we'll take care of that. So that's what we've gone for. Um, so here we go now. Let's let's line up the strings <sighs> this way. We'll put them all through, and then we'll we'll do a close up at the other end. Um, yeah. So lefty. Uh, nut change after this and then I have got a bit of uh, preparing of a bit of cleaning up of a bit of mahogany I got given or I found going for free a big piece of mahogany on our local marketplace on Facebook and I got in just quick enough and um, uh, very kindly the fella let me have it. Ten foot piece uh, of mahogany. It's got a load of little clout nail type things in it, so I've got to get rid of all of those. And then I'm going to uh, cut it up into sizes that I know are right for guitar tops, because I think it's, a, it's an inch thick, so it, it's either good as a sandwich construction, sorry, pancake construction, it's more of a sandwich, but hey, uh, pancake construction body, which you have two layers, um, but and then with a top on top of that. So because at uh, an inch, it's you know two inches thick, and anyway, or it's um, possibly better as a you know vintage mahogany top, um, in which case there's plenty of room for taking off all the imperfections, and um, you know perhaps. There's a, there's a lot of black mm, mastic or bitumen, crusty bitumen stuff. Right, let's get a, a close-up on the headstock here. So you can see what I'm doing with the tuning e thing. Yeah, hopefully you can. For some reason, this really feels like I should zoom out even more. But, okay, that'll do. Right, so the key to... Um, Stable tuning, obviously, as I said before, it is to do with the stretching of the strings and getting nut slots good. We've got both of those taken care of, or we will have, but also getting the uh, strings wound on in a tidy way that doesn't uh, result in doesn't result in um, storing up too much slack on the posts, because that's never a great idea to have loads of slack on the post. Now, as I said, these tuner posts have two holes, but I'm only going to use one, and I'm going to start on the top one and let my strings wind underneath the top one so they come out lower. Um, so I've lined all up, lined all, all the holes up. And because this nut is adjustable and it comes out, if you remember, um, just to prevent it, the risk of it sort of flinging off sideways, I always recommend that you fit the D and the G first when you've got an adjustable nut. So here we go. So I pull it all the way through to begin with, and then I take the string, grab it at the first fret, 
I pull it back one fret's worth and start winding. This is a sort of standard measure each time. And then as I start winding it, and I've made that bend, I go over the um, loose string first with the held string. And then as the loose string comes around, I pull it up and then I push the held string below the loose string as it comes around next time. Oh, well, that's didn't expect that. And we're just going to restart that. The, um, as you can probably guess, the string ball got caught underneath, so it's pushed through and I'd end up with more on there than I'd really want. Okay, let's start again. Pulled the first bit through. I'm going to pull back one fret's worth. We're going to start from there now. Do the same thing. Hold it tight until it catches. Direct the held one over the loose one. Pull the loose one through and up and then direct the held one under the loose one and as it comes around the second time. And together, those two things form a sort of lock of its own with a minimum of um, what string around the post, a dependable minimum. And that, that's enough to keep it tightly in place um, and not enough, not so much that it stores up a load of slack. So then we do the same with the G to just keep the nut held down and this time I will make sure it's pulled all the way through I hope it is through pull back one fret's worth hold it tight until it crimps or bends if you like kinks then hold over the loose one and then under the loose one and pull the loose one up just to get it out of the way as you come around and then you can kind of pull them together so that they're reasonably tightly together one fret's worth turns out to be a, a bit more than one, uh, a bit more than two complete winds, but you know. And then it can carry on and do all the other ones after that. The my experience is that the wound strings are much grippier, so you could get away with half a or three quarters of a fret's worth. I'm going to stick with one just to keep it in my sort of safe zone, but. Um, you really do need the full frets worth for the plain strings because they have, they can have a tendency to slip. Now, of course, if you if you were really concerned about that, you could use the 90 degree locking business of these tuners, um, but I don't because it's too fiddly. But that doesn't change the fact that they're good quality tuners, which is why I keep on using them. And so, in a sense, we've just got a redundant spare. Uh, hold 90 degrees to the one we're using. It doesn't do any harm to anyone. So, so this this consistent stringing. Of course, the thicker the string, the less times it appears to go round for the for the same amount of pullback. So here we go on the B. And now I've I've come to like this guitar. I, the first time I plugged it in. It had some problems, but uh, I loved the tone, and I haven't actually seen what the pickups are, and, and now I've missed my chance because I didn't didn't lift the uh, lid. Like I said, I might, but uh, I like the tone of it. It's it's great sounding. It's got the Dave Gilmore um, uh, neck. I can't remember whether it's neck add in, neck added in or bridge added in to you know so it's all three on in the end that's what you get um it's a nice modification and it just looks the biz you know it's got the it's got the black and the white and uh yeah and and, uh, and the neck is it's not a great glaring white maple thing here, you know and he's chosen a good a neck that works well with this i've polished out those scratches as much as i humanly can um and I think it, you know, there's a limit to what we can do. But, you know, it's only a small cosmetic thing. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do right now is, while we're at it, checks to see if it's still working, doesn't trust it, is to um, position, come on, position the thingy, this uh, string tree. Now, we know it was a bit off target, right? So the way to do it is to, not the easiest thing. That see if you can still see while I'm doing this. Yeah. Okay. So 
I sort of tend to do it like this by hand. I get to where the original one was, so we can try and mask off as much of it as possible by covering it. And then I press down in a straight line as I possibly can go, and then make a little impression. And I then want to ensure that that's as central as I can possibly be, which it doesn't actually look like it right the second. So I'm going to just slightly move it again. I'm going to come along here and go, yep, that looks pretty good. So it's a little bit off from where it was before. We're going to be slightly to one side. It's not going to be the easiest of little holes to drill because it already had one and now we've got a little, little um, the thing I'm looking for is we've now got a filled thing. Um, we want a one and a half mil to start with and we'll widen it at the top. Screwdriver on. Okay, so we're going to go in next to the original like this. See how far that is. Okay, it's tricky this because if you if you don't get the pilot hole sort of about right, you can run the risk of splitting things. So I've widened it up a fair bit um, just to make sure that whatever we do, we're not going to put the wood of the headstock under too much strain. There we go. So it's only a tiny bit to the left of where it was. Um, with a bit of luck, though, we really won't notice it because um, it'll be tidier. That better stay on there. There you go. So it's only that all that was was an aesthetic. It, it's a shame when you've got a nice finished neck like this when the strings go off a, a bit, appear to go off a bit to one side. Um, and there you go, they're sort of nicely in line with everything now. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is just gently pull them to seat them on. No, I won't be playing any Pink Floyd. Oh, I might, I might. Now, you get copyrighted and stuff. Making it up. Um, so we'll just get it up to tune for a minute. straight away it feels great um, so let's just zoom out a bit so the next thing to do remember I said that tuning is 50% your uh, nut slots and these are these are actually a little bit high on this end so I may need to take this nut off and just lower it a tiny bit unless there's a bit more adjustment no there isn't okay before I go any further it's not as low at this end I want to start with this adjustable nut with the I want it with the with the when it's at its lowest with the grub screws wound out if you like I want the strings to sit on the first fret and I couldn't really tell ahead of this um, ahead of refitting strings whether or not that was the case so while the strings are fairly fresh on board I'm going to remove this and I've got a sense of how much needs to come off and I will take a little bit more off this um, nut base <laughs> like that so so easy uh, okay temporarily lost that but shall I use these instead maybe I shall let's use these okay so I'm going to be careful to remove some height and what I'll do is I'll chase it down using a mm, this thing We'll concentrate on this end and we'll measure it. 
Okay, three, 348, and I want to take 0.4 off, so I want it down to 3 at this treble end, and I want it done so it stays straight. So I'll take sort of the bulk material off if I can in one first go. You can see that it's, it's starting to get very difficult to, to even hold this object now because it's getting small. Um, I say 340 at the trouble end, 315, so we're getting there. Yeah, so it's uh, the smaller this thing gets, the harder it is to hold it, but um, it's not impossible. And if you just go slow and then you move to the finer grades of paper, you can just adjust. If it's got a bit of a lean on it, you can sort that out separately. So that's coming in at. 308 but with a tiny bit of a lean so I'm going to the finer paper actually as it happens the lean isn't terribly important when you've got it on the uh, grub screws because they're like little feet so you, you can have a less precise base on the nut and it will still work pretty well or very well in fact because because it stands on its grub screws you don't actually end up with it standing on its base so the base could be pretty crappy and you get, get away with it. So I'll just drop it back in quickly for a minute. As I say, with it in place and um, a bit of pressure on the strings just to whiz round and I'll put the middle ones on first just to pressure it down. They're almost touching. The uh, low E is touching down there. B is nearly touching. Okay. Now, interestingly, this tells me there's a very, very slight mismatch between the the actual um, the radius of the nut and the um, and we knew that we knew that because we know the nut radius is 12, and this guitar I think is 14 remember so we knew we were going to be living with a balance in between now the alternative we can do if we don't like that if it doesn't work once we've got it playing is we can um, we could just very slightly adjust down the um, the offending slots and I tried to avoid doing that um, but there are you know obviously there are times when the when the radius doesn't match because you can't you know the tusk basically doesn't make a, uh, a nut for every single choice of radius that you, that you can choose to put on using um, you know using these parts caster like this so we have, we're always sort of going for a compromise okay that's still um, okay it's still above um, it's, it's very very slight I'll do a tiny bit more and then we'll call it done um, like I said, it's I quite like to start right on the first fret if I can help it. Um, so I'll do a little bit on here. Partly I'm taking down the metal of the grub screw, which is what I want to do because I don't want that sticking out too high anyway, but that's why it's taking a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So it's, by the time we get finished, this is a very, very small piece of nut, um, which is, by the way, all your guitar ever really needs. The, the business with um, most guitars come with far too much, far too tall a nut, far too tall or far too high first fret action, um, and so on and so on. So the, the nut basically always, almost always has a ton more material than is ever needed, which is a pity because you, to get it, to stay in tune and work well, you have to do all this removing material. Oops, get these in the right holes. Okay, down you go, thank you. Okie dokie, get under there, get in the slot. Do you know what? Um, I was amazed. I keep, of course, I forget 
um, how other people watch stuff. And um, so those are all, by the way, those are all touching now on the first fret, just about. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just raise the uh, action slightly now, just to clear. There we go. Yeah, so um, somebody made a comment. I was amazed that they spotted that I... Um, there go. So I've got a bit, a bit more screws sticking out at the um, treble end, but that's not a problem. Yeah, they spotted that I ground down the end of my thingy here <laughs> because it cut, cuts swirls onto headstock. Okay, so let's have a look. Uh, that's nice and low, so this needs to go in a bit now. Yeah, a, I thought, what kind of amazing screen are you watching this on that you can spot details like that? You're a superhuman. Okay, that's fine. Don't worry that one of them's sticking out a bit sli slightly more than the other. It could be that one of the holes that I drilled is just very slightly different. Um, deeper and it's enough to make one stick out but it's absolutely fine it, it's sitting in the right sort of place the mismatch between the 12 inch nut radius and the um, 14 inch board isn't isn't enough to make me want to take a file to the slots really um, you know the, the aim of getting unmolested factory slots Um, it's like a bonus, so I don't want to cut them if I can help it. Hmm. Right, I'm going to check the action again because it's definitely I've moved one out of uh, a lot, um, out of intonation for sure. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to check the action at the far end and be prepared to make tweaks. Where's the thing gone? I've had, uh, hung them up here. There's one. Yeah, so I'm going to do some tweaks. Also, the intonation. Too long. That's good. That, no. Ah. Ah. Yeah. Now I worried about this. Hmm. Mm. That's why I was playing with the intonation. I've got a horrible feeling. I've got a feeling the bridge isn't in the right place. <sighs> Didn't say that in advance. This is kind of important. Let me. Let me check this with a lead and a tuner. This is really critical, and uh, okay, I noticed this when I was doing the the setup part. I've also got almost this is impossible. This is round the wrong way. I noticed that as well. Okay, um, hold on, things things are changing. So first of all, the jack socket doesn't want to go in here, which suggests to me it's in the wrong place. Uh, right, so it's really got to be down the bottom, I think. And then we've got to tighten it up. But it's loose currently. So we've got to find some pliers, which will do the job. And now I'm, there they are. Yeah, so if, the, if you get the jack the, the live lug of the jack socket 
pointing the wrong way around, basically, um, you will find that you can't plug in uh, the guitar jack because it, it'll try to push the live lug away as the tip of the, uh, the jack plug goes in and it will run it into the body of the guitar and it will stop it going in. So this way around, there you go, it goes in and out. Hurrah. That's a little detail and it always caught, used to catch me out. Right, all the time. Right, so that's that secure. Good, take care of that. Now let's do the, the bit that could be a, a sort of showstopper. Well, it, it could mean a lot of extra work. This, and this is a critical bit that can catch us out every time when we make our own guitars. Um, Just get away with this. <sighs> hmm. So all of this has to come forward now. So that's what I was concerned about, that this is all, all in the wrong place. And we've just got to hope that we can get these screws to push this forward to the right place. Um, so at the moment, the strings were too long. Let's try. That's good. We're just there. It, it's being stopped by the, uh, the 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 E can't go any further forward because the screw's in the way. But we're just on the mark. Any any it's, it's a, a fraction away from being intonatable, which I'm pleased to say we just got there. So everything has to come a bit longer than it was. have to push these saddles they don't naturally want us to come through which is a bit rubbish even though they've got springs on them they don't really like moving that much <laughs> so let's try this now the intonation thing by the way is always a subjective thing because it depends on primarily the biggest variable in it is how hard you press or fret the note so two people different people will do it differently good um, so the setting that position that might work for me may be slightly different for you because you may not press as hard or you may press harder Never 
pick that I want. Always oh, one I don't want. It's not good, is it? <laughs> right. Well, mercifully, that's intonated. Good. So, stretching time, grab the strings, push and pull between thumb and forefinger, and basically do that to get rid of any residual slack. I forgot to check the action, which I'll do again in a minute, and tweak that if necessary. Um, just stretch the strings between thumb and forefinger, and then do some bends, and then go back and do some more stretching. It's pretty good already, actually, but you want to go until there's no more detuning de when you do this. If there is any detuning, it will be because you're squeezing out the unreleased slack, not because there is any stickage, stickaging in the nut, because we're pretty sure there isn't, thanks to the thanks to the uh, tunum, uh, tunumatic, the tusk nut. Do some more stretching in a minute. Let's check the action. We're barely over 1.25. Dead on 1.5. Uh, 1.5, bit low on this one. So a tiny, tiny tweak there, and a tiny tweak there. Good. This one, fraction low again. You can also kind of see it with the eyeballing it across here. Um, fast time now, fraction too high, down it goes a bit. Yep. I expect this one will be. That one's good. Back down the other side, right. Now, the issue here, just quickly, with the tremolo, this feels very stiff. Um, Andy wants down only, so I'm just going to use my, my press-in Wilco arm. Feels very stiff. Um, oh, yeah. And it's not doing return to uh, pitch very nicely either. So there's a couple of things I suspect is are a problem, and one of them will be the these screws here. So I'm going to need to uh, slack them off one by one, really. Um, it's not exactly the best way to do it, but um, I just need to move them out of the way. Now, what we need is we need them to be higher rather than lower, if I can get a little bite at them. We don't want them pushing the front of this plate down at all. It's got to be away from doing that. Maybe I can do it just like this. See, it doesn't, it's not very happy. Okay. It's, there's some... Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's not really fitting this... This uh, bridge isn't fitting this guitar very well. Um, according to this, the bridge is a little bit out of line. It's a bit closer at this end than it is at that end maybe causing it to not want to perform terribly well. Um, the problem with that 
is, oh, well, I suppose I ought to do this one up first. So, the problem is whether it's going to stay in tune in operation, because the alternative is to go back out and, um, yeah, it's not, first of all, it's not, it's not sitting down flat, and I don't think it's because there's not enough pull on it. it I'm not sure it wants to sit flat, and that, I will worry that that could have to do with the um, kind of position and alignment of this thing where the screws are being put in but or even whether they're the right screws for this I should hope they are but one of them's been kind of mangled a bit so I'm trying to just uh, start off by getting them out oh god that's a, that's a better movement um, that's pulled up okay so now what we really want is we want this to be flat. See this this thing doesn't look like it wants to um, sit properly and the reason it doesn't want to sit properly is because it's banging against the back here so it's not naturally going to go there. Shit. Okay. Oh, well, this is going to cost an extra set of strings, unfortunately. We need to look at this because it's not not in the right place. That's a shame. I thought this was going to be a, a simple finish. Uh, but there's a thing, you you know, the position of the bridge is something you can't know until it's there. And so, the, so what typically happens is that somebody gets a basic strap body and then fits a... Wilkinson bridge with a, a large block solid block tremolo to it and the downside of doing that is that you end up with a bridge that's too big for the uh, body and it's too in other words that the route on the back here isn't cut for this size bridge it's made for it's cut out for a small zinc alloy jobby so, we need to get this apart. Stupid red banded things that don't work. Uh, these are not Phillips. Uh, they're not Phillips. We need to look at what the, the deal is. So, I don't think this is able to sit flat. That's the first problem because where it, for where it is, the, there's not enough room in there. And I can see that Andy, I think, has probably had a go at trimming a little of it back before, but it's not enough. And so this block won't sit flat. Uh, now, judging by this, um, I, I got a feeling that it's, it's also slightly, I don't know what I'm looking for. Whatever it is I'm looking for. It, it feels to me it might be just slightly away from horizontal level as well. Yeah, it tilts, it drifts in that way by about, actually by about two millimeters. So that's gonna, mm, that's gonna make things a bit difficult. But on top of that, it doesn't, um, it doesn't shut back here. So the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take this little edge off here to make it work. Um, there's an edge here and Andy's taken some of that off and we'll do that with a Dremel because it's chiseling it's not so good. So I think we might be able to tidy that up a little bit this way. Oh, no, that's not the one I wanted. Um, but whether or not it's going to actually like to work in that um, tilted position is anyone's Yes, and the only way around that in its turn is to fill those original holes and redo them. Now, what, what the other problem is you get here, let's bring you, let's bring you in close. Are you still running? Oh, let's hope you are. Um, 
I bring you in very close. It's all a bit of a mess now. Let's bring you in nice and close. Better you see what's going on. There we are. Um, if I were... No, right, just talk amongst myself while I get these strings out. I can use these again because they're not stressed. But I do to get them out, I do need to just slightly straighten these bits out so I can actually pull them through without too much hassle. It's, a, it's, a, it's worthwhile using them again. Well, I say without too much hassle, but actually, in order to do it, I've got to really flatten them out, not pretend. So I'm going to need to use these. Um, yeah, that's, so that's, that's a very conventional, typical problem of putting in a decent uh, tremolo block and then finding that the thing isn't going to play ball because the route is not set up for uh, a quality bridge. It's made for the narrower, shallower, um, shorter, less bulky zinc alloy ones. And then you've got a problem with widening. You, know, you can do it, obviously. You can widen the pickup route, um, but you have to sort of work out where you're doing the widening because you either re try and extend the route, which is a big deal to route on top of something. You have to take everything off and start with a flat body. Or if you're going to do it just by um, strimming, no, you know, what's that word? Dremeling away a little bit, then you can do that too. But you need to know exactly which bits are currently getting in the way and which bits need trimming back. Um, and it and it's you know if you if you dremel it, it's always going to have that little bit of a home tweaked look about it, which of course uh, it already has because it's already been tweaked a little bit in there. I can see. So so this is the the pain in the of upgrading your bridge. Um, and I've got the similar thing coming up uh, tomorrow, next couple of days. I've just ordered um, two Wilkinson left-handed WVC bridges for um, Martin. One for his uh, Made in Mexico left-handed Strat, which isn't here. And another one for a sort of interesting Strat-bridged Strat bridged offset guitar that some unknown brand but that we're going to put a decent bridge in anyway because it's no reason why it shouldn't play well. And I'm sort of half expecting, in the case of each of them, to to need to be making modifications. E even the uh, Made in Mexico, because that thing, uh, as far as I remember, most of the ones I've ever seen came with uh, pretty crappy um, zinc alloy thin zinc alloy bridge blocks, which always amazed me that you were buying a made in Mexico fender um, and it had the cheapest zinc alloy block you could ever imagine to get on a tremolo guitar. Uh, couldn't see the point of that. So I'm just going to put these out of the way on this here chair where nobody's going to upset them. Right, so now what we have to do is we have to put this through again and we have to sort of look at what's obstructing what. So we know that this isn't sitting because it's kind of clunking into there. So we can dremel some of that away. Um, for, for starters, we can ask ourselves, when we've got this in place, and to, to get it in place, let's put two screws in just for now, so we can simulate it being fitted. And with it in place like this, then what I can do is look at the range of movement that we've got and we haven't got. So the whole thing about the strap bridge is it works off the front, sorry, the back edge of these screws. Um, and they, they're quite precise in the way they do or don't work. So the first thing is we're struggling, when it's all done up, we're struggling to get in past this little bit here. Um, we could do with just taking that back. There's a lip on both of these where the finishes overrun. But the other thing that gets in our way is Providing we start there, we've also got a slightly limited range of movement back, and it's been hampered by excess finish. So we can also, I think we should dremel some of the finish off there as well, because it's just getting in the way. Um, now, I get what's happened here is, in a way, there's either a deliberate thing or a lucky accident, and that Andy has um, defaulted to fitting this bridge with lots of wax in here on the screws, by the way. Um, he's defaulted to fitting this bridge quite far that way, 
which overcomes the lack of room for this size block. Normally, this this cavity is routed for a small block, and normally you wouldn't be able to, if the, if the bridge was set a little further back where it should be, you'd suddenly find this banging out, and you wouldn't be able to get any movement, adequate movement out of it. But here, the, where he's actually happened to put it, it's good because we're able to get that movement, but we get it by pushing these right to the front of this is reach, and it's almost, I mean, it's it's a good choice. He's made a good a good technical decision there. Um, so we may just get away without having to widen the whole thing, which is great. So uh, I commend you on that, Andy and Zach. Right now, let's let's go and look at the tweaking. So those those are slightly skew with makes it a little bit less likely for the tremolo to move smoothly but for two millimeters in that it's probably not the very end of the world although it's not ideal um while i'm doing this i'll probably kind of be thinking about shall we fill them and re-drill them because we can do it because we'll be in the same spot pretty much so it's not really that much you won't it's not like we'll see a bunch of holes that we filled in now this is always a typical way i'm trying to get this to work and the mandrel has clammed up on me and it's stuck in there and it doesn't want to open out at all good good let's try this again so i'm choosing this sort of one here um the size of i've got three sizes but i'm going to go with this medium sized one because it feels to me like the one that will be good for now it's not going to tie up gosh darn it uh, this is about the right size for the, the corner that we're cutting into. This should be all right. That should work. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, so noise, I'm afraid. Nope, not noise. No noise. Now, I think I'll also switch. There's a load of overhang here, which I'll take out too, a load of extra. But I think I'll also, in a minute, um, I'll, I'll revert to the little one just to get in the very corners. Um, it's good. It's taking away this finish that's liable to get in the way but has no other purpose. So those um, those little tiny blobs of finish sticking up there, um, all they're going to do at the moment is serve to let me get my little brush. It's just going to serve to um, stop the tremolo moving where it needs to move. And we can we can once I've got this cleaned out to where I want it, I can paint this with conductive paint again. So I'm just feeling my way, and then we'll put the we'll reattach the bridge and just swing it around a bit. But I'm not yet finished with all this masses of gloopy finish So that's, I mean, that's straight away, that's a little bit tidier. Let's get the small version in there. Um, not like that we want. Yeah, so this is the, this is always the tricky bit, fitting a, a upgrading to a large bridge. And the, and the truth is, if you, if you don't get it working, um, I suppose that it's a shame because in a way you might as well have not bought the extra quality bridge um, because it's really, its quality is in the 
operation of the tremolo arm, the smoothness of the Wilkinson arm, and also the, the kind of smoothness of the return to pitch and all those good things you get with it. So it's worth doing our best to get it how, as good as it can be. So I'm just cutting in here a little bit now and going round this corner. See that I've taken off some of the obstructive bits. Now let's put the, the block back in and let's have a kind of feel of it moving around again. And let's see what we can, how much improved it is. Now the secret of a good free moving tremolo is a couple of things. Obviously it's can the block move now this is, I can see this hitting something on the way down because of the fact it's going off sideways and I need to find what it's, what it's hitting. Okay, so trying to come back down. It's, it's hitting, oops. Um, it's, it's kind of, let's go a little bit tighter on these so we're near to operational tightness, right? So the trick is when you're doing these up, you go only to the exact point where the um, screwing down starts to try to move, lift the back off. There's a little chamfer on the front of here, but don't go any tighter than that. So go to where it starts to lift the back of the trim block and then go back until it leaves it flat down on the floor. And that's your, that's your optimum point. Now there's movement here because these are extra wide uh, fittings, the holes are extra wide because this is a sort of conversion model of the tremolo. Um, so we'll try and stiffen it up with an extra screw in there and we'll apply the same principle. So that's not, actually you know what, that's not too bad. So the, the movement there feels quite good. The limited range is now only being stopped off as this thing hits the back of the uh, hits the back of the thing, and that actually is the back. Sort of feel it's hard to see now. That's, that's that's heading down. Okay, so the limit is when it when it decks out on the front of its chamfer. Basically, you can't get any further than that. That's its kind of limit, um, which which is a fair old range of tremolo operation. So I think uh, the way that's feeling right now, I think we've cleared up. A sticky problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the rest of these screws right back in now and actually to be honest all of the inside screws none of them really need to be that tight at all and don't, you know so if you're going to stay clear of anything don't go anywhere near tightening down the front kind of back well, well off. What you really want is it that loose to begin with not so keen on that, but that's because of the bigger screw type, um, you know, to allow it to be universal fitting. But let's have a look. So just to be really precise on this, let's feel this tightening business at the front here, right? Pushing it down, letting it go. Um, so do it all one by one. Pushing it down, letting it go. Pushing it down, letting it go down, let it go. You can feel it pulling against your finger. Down, go. And there we are. Down, off. So that's our, our free movement. It feels okay. Right. I'm pleased that we've, I think, that's simplified things. So let's get the 
these on. Now, there's always a question that, that comes into, sorry about your view up there, rubbish. There's always a question that comes into this is, are, is the number of springs you've got enough? And really, it's, the answer is all to do with how far in you have pushed your, tightened your, tightened your tremolo claw screws, these ones, um, and uh, how, what gauge strings you're using, for example. So you can make a tremolo work with three screws and um, you can feel that it's a lot of hard work to get it to come down. But if we now restring it, so let's go back further out. I'm sort of optimistic, actually, that that little bit of adjustment is uh, enough. I can never see you emailing me. I'm concentrating on the camera view. Come on, Sam. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of pleased that that should be enough to uh, fix the problem. So I'm just going to wipe away some of the dust that we created. Now, that at the moment, it's too much too heavy a or too tight. But when we get the strings back in, we'll get a different take on it. Now, the problem with the strings is the thin ones are going to struggle to go through this thing. So what I tend to do is use, uh, I'm going to use a piece of, if I can find an appropriate piece of shrink tubing to push them through using that. That sometimes really helps because, you know, it's a, seven quid set of strings or whatever it is and I don't want to just throw them away um, just because we have to take them off to sort the bridge out. See it's a waste really. So let's see what we can do. Now first of all I'm going to just load up the D string here as before and I'm going to just run it almost exactly as we had before. It's going to crimp it in the same sort of place but should be alright because we've got a good double turn around there to hold everything nice and tight. So this should keep the nut in place. There we are. Uh, now let's do the G. If we can figure out which one's the G. There it is. The G is probably the least likely to tangle. It's the other ones. That, so the G sort of uh, flattened out. But if you want to get them through a tremolo block, you really have to take your time to straighten them out again otherwise they just won't do the thing you want that, sorry that should go you said hopefully and the other thing is if they're way forward these blocks you may have to push push back um, well, this G is pretty stiffly in position all the way through please G thank you Thank you, thank you. Okay, we're going to get there. We will get there. Still got one other guitar to do. Mighty good. Let's put these two on so they're not flapping about while we turn the guitar over in a minute. So what about Mr. Hancock today. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you say? How, how sleazy can politics be? Well, only as sleazy as we already pretty much all of us know it is anyway. Eh? I don't think anything really surprises me. Um, now, let's have a look. If we bend this out flat, well, we should get it through. Yes, it was, uh, no, it doesn't surprise me in the slightest that he was caught doing that. I just, um, there seems to be something wrong in the world of, or the, the egos who are attracted to politics. And I say this as somebody who, reluctantly just recently stood for and got elected to the parish council in our village. Um, and I say reluctantly because I didn't really want anything to do with the, the way politics has been done. And the only reason I went into it is because I'm idealistic enough to be willing to try and change that. Um, 
you know, knowing that it's going to, it'll, it'll just get me nothing but grief, almost, well, not nothing, but, but a large dose of grief from a lot of vested interests. So, um, but, you know, it, it, you sort of look at the, the Hancock thing and I think to myself, part of me, my, part of my reaction is just to go, I don't care, I just don't care. They're all, everybody who's attracted to that kind of level of politics is, has a has an inadequate, damaged ego and seeks power because of how it makes them feel about themselves in such a way that they can't achieve in any other more enlightened or spiritually wholesome way. And I genuinely believe that. Uh, or that's how I understand it. And it seems to be borne out by the kinds of people who seek power in that way. And um, that doesn't mean everybody who went, ever went into politics is a bad person, but... It's, it's far too many people who, even if they don't know it intellectually, are attracted to it because it allows them the, an exercise of power which I suppose ultimately feels irresistible to them um, for, the, for unhealthy reasons. So I guess I'm, it doesn't surprise me in any way that people then, those people then, when they get into positions of power, that they are seduced by it and the trappings and the opportunities to misappropriate or, you know, help their buddies in certain ways that's, that the rest of us would find shocking. Um, so no, I'm I'm not surprised. Um, but I and I, and I but I suppose what I am slightly surprised at is is the degree to which I was sort of prepared to just, or found myself just saying, well, you know, I don't care. There's gonna, we know, I know they're going to do that. They're going to be corrupt and Hancock's going to do this, that and the other. And I just thought to myself, wait a minute, why, why didn't I, I didn't stand for it in the village here and I prepared to challenge it um, at cost to me. Um, and yet, why am I just sort of rolling over and going, oh, well, He's going to do it. Why the hell? They're all sleazy turds. <laughs> um, that sort of surprised me, really. Just for starters, now, okay, now we've got a better sit, sit down of this. Now what I'm going to do now, which you couldn't have done before, that's, that's looking good. Um, I'm now going to slack off the screws at the back here, because what I want is I want this to, I want this to be at its equilibrium point, i.e. I want it to go down when I press it at the lightest want it to be a light touch rather than too heavy. Now if I just whiz out and take this, uh, take these screws right back out, we're, we're reducing the force on the springs which is going to reduce the, reduce the pull on the strings. Now this is what happens, it's now, it's now allowing it to catch on something again. So, yeah, that's not a smooth move. It's not very smooth. And I can't help thinking it's got something to do with the fact that it's tilted off centre. Okay, so we're not running out of space back there. That's as far as it will go. So it's hitting the back courtesy of the saddles. Uh, sorry, courtesy of this. It's grounding out on the bevel, which is pretty much as, as far as you can go, as far down as you can go on this kind of tremolo. But it's not wanting to go back because it's not... I have a horrible feeling that these holes aren't cleanly in a straight line. Uh, hmm. Okay. So I think the only way around this, frankly, is to fill these holes and ensure 
they're exactly in the straight line. Now this means that we're going to cost us a set of strings extra, so I'm going to have to put that on the bill, Andy, I'm sorry, and Zach. But this is worth, I couldn't, I don't want to send this back without this bit corrected. And it's, it's going to require a little bit of extra time. But I think we've, we've got enough movement in here, uh, which is good. Um, you know, the position, the basic position of the tremolo is okay to get a smooth movement. But I think the problem is it's now, it's not on straight. So I think we're going to have to sacrifice this set of strings, Ernie Balls, tens. Goodbye, Ernie. It's just, there's no point making them run a third time of tightening up. So we'd just be in for broken strings at that point. So let's, let's accept our losses. Now, the next stage is to, is to get into the filling and re-drilling. And actually, it's a very quick process. It doesn't take, you don't have to wait days for things to dry out. You can go straight on top of what you've just done. But what you've got to do is when you drill, drill and fill, you've got to ensure that you get your first two right. In this case, the first one could be right as our start point. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, it's, we'll use the first one as the start point. It's the ones after that that have gone off. And individually, this is incredibly sensitive to these being out of line. If they're out of line, and the whole thing is also slightly diagonal, it won't work smoothly. Which is such a shame, because smooth is really what this um, tremolo is all about. So, I am going to just double check everything a minute. Pull out springs once again. Uh, let's just let's just double check the movement one more time. So we're up against there, that side is down against there. We're flat against there. That's what we really want. Flat against there. That's now straightened out. You see, but it's kind of def it's almost defaulted to straightening out. So it wants to be there, which is not where things are. So it's kind of told us where it wants to sit. And what's happened is the actual position of the screw holes has pulled it onto a, a twist and it doesn't like it. So this thing wants to sit there at best and that is now parallel. Um, and if we had it sitting there, we would theoretically be able to get it to work. So I'm going to, let me just check again the first one. I'm going to start with the assumption that first one's good. We'll go with that first one and we'll re redo the other ones. So, first one good. And the problem is if you were to draw a line, I don't know how long this recording is still going. Sorry, this is now running over time. If you were to draw a line on these, maybe I can, you probably might just see that these aren't, aren't well, they're tilted and they're also slightly, very slightly off. It's hard to see. They are tilted away. They're tilted sort of that way. And um, they're very slightly off each other, which, which I think is what helps the thing to not seat. Also, um, I think if we just, if we trust the first one of these by dropping this back in, Trust the first one. Um, I think where the first one is positioned, if I just go with one screw for a minute. If we trust the position of the first one, I can't get it to stay in place. But the first one is, is far enough out not to be hitting anything. Um, it's the other ones that have to be back as well. So I think the first one is a good start point. I think that will also help me sort things out. Right, now the, we're in a solid bit of wood, so there's no problem there. We're quite far forward. We're not right up next to the edge. The question is, what do we fill it with? Um, I think, in this case, that's not going to be big enough. I think we need to fill with, to get this to drill new holes in, I think we need to go six mils. And that's quite a big chunk of thing. So let's see what, if we've got anything smaller or better. We've got 10 mil. 
We've got plenty of six mil. Oh, note to self, take home one of these micro calipers. Right, let's, if we go with six mil, um, I'm going to fill that second one. Yeah, these holes are about, they're about four actually, by the time they're in. So six isn't bad. It'll give us a fresh bite at it. So for six mil, we're going to need a six mil bit, which is this baby here. Um, and we're going to need glue and we're going to need the saw. Now I can, uh, I was going to say, I could do this. I could, I'll do this bit with everything in and then to trim these back, I'll need to flip the plate out, out of the way which is a bit of a pain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my little helper, my little start drill helper. Just something to help the bigger drill bit get going. So we're going to keep one in the way. So th these aren't going to be that much further out of place, um, but they're going to be just a little bit more. So we've got to straighten up the thing. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Yeah, I can see it going off in a line. Right, good oh good. Um, dig out those last bits of sawdust. Possibly put this one down a little further. Okay, so I'm going to fill these all with the six mil inserts, and they're all going to be um, pretty much hidden under the uh, block. And at worst, you might just see the front tiniest front. No, probably. Yeah, you might see on one of them, you might see just the front of the wood but we can paint put a dab of paint on that so the next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to cut me six five in this case five little pieces of fill um, and then i'm going to load holes with glue and then i'm going to uh, do a bunch of things so it need six of these little cut pieces Five of these. And what I do with these is I'm going to score a line down them, all the way down, um, which is a sort of glue release line. And it means that instead of forming a vacuum or sorry hyd hydraulic sort of vacuum when we push down tap this in uh, the glue can actually come up the side of the dowel and um, out the top so it doesn't get trapped and cause a yeah cause a vacuum you know what i mean a vacuum probably isn't the right word no it, so it's not yes yeah, so we're not making a sort of pneumatic valve or something right so we get this we get some glue, we get some blah, 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 we get a little hammer, blah, blah, blah. Well, like I say, everything always ends up taking longer than you think. I thought this was going to be tuners on, strings on, job done. But I'm afraid that is not what it has turned out to be. So, a spare set of tens, Dario tens, ready for later on, he said optimistically. So the reason I've gone oversize in the into the sort of six mil when it's only a four mil hole to begin with is you, if you go too little, you're sort of putting your screws back into a mush, um, you know, with only a small um, a small bit of wood jammed in there to help things along. So what I want to have happen here is that these go in and give me enough room to um, basically um, 
for the screws to bite into without splitting them. So what I'm doing is just to begin with, I'm just slightly tapering the end so that it will go in and then I'm going to again rub each one in glue so it has a chance of extra stick and there's already glue in there and now I'm going to tap that into place and that's the end. Now what I could do at this point, uh, but I can leave it till afterwards, um, once I've got the thing off I'll cut these off and then I'll trim them with a sharp knife. Um, so that's not an easy thing to do but you, we can tape off, put some tape down to make sure that it's we don't scuff anything with the knife. I mean the body here is a little bit weathered anyway but you know, we want to keep it as good as we can. So each one of these, as you see, I'm going to tap it down to the bottom. So the idea is the difficulty in doing doing your own tremolo holes, and it is a real sensitive thing, is if you get them slightly out of sync with each other, they tighten up and kind of twist the operation a little bit. Um, and that can be the difference between it working beautifully or sticky, you know, um, sticky tremolo. So this was a bit off center and that doesn't help either if it's sort of going slightly sideways. And um, some people get really freaked out about, you know, which direction you have your have your springs in. My experience is that doesn't make a blind bit of difference, no matter how passionate people get about it. What does make a difference though is if the tremolo itself isn't um, 90 degrees to the whole thing because it doesn't want to be pulling on one corner and not the other prop, you know. It needs to be perpendicular to the center line of the neck. Um, so that's really the most important thing I'm correcting here is that slight wonder. And the reason, the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to start by cleaning this all back, making these, fitting all these, taking the plate, chopping these back, and then we'll put the tremolo back in, put it in with the first one down, put it into its correct position, and then I'm going to drill inside one other of them and I'm going to work my way across all of them. Yeah, that's the end of that. So it looks quite extreme. There's our things. Now the slightly difficult bit is um, we're going to take the thing off. If I can find the other thing that does the thing. We're going to take these out. Um, in a sense, if we want to make things easier on ourselves, might want to take the whole thing off, which means cutting the connections at the the claw, tremolo claw, and um, at the jack socket. So now we're just somewhere between those two screw bits. How do you do this? Yeah, I, it's just a, it's one of those things you can't have a decent quality Wilkinson tremolo that doesn't give you beautiful smooth shimmer on a lovely guitar like this. So I've got to do it. Yeah, it was quite good to have the start screw. Um, the first one is a good guide point because I was confident that that would go work all the way. Now, this is a little bit tricky because <laughs> it doesn't want to come off because it doesn't want to come off because there's an overhang. I forgot about the overhang. Oh. So you see how we've gone from being almost done to walking back 10 steps. But there were, you know, you've got to say that surely it's got to be worth it. Right, over there you go. You go, out of there you come. Let's see. Oh my god, why is that so tight? Because there's absolutely no reach to the jack plug. 
that's not helpful. <sighs> right. <laughs> so, uh, Andy, Zach, um, you want a bit more give than this. I'm going to have to take this apart and replace the replace the. Um, what is wrong with this? I'm going to replace the that thing, jack socket wire, because uh, it's, it's too short, really, and, and means that we can't we can't maneuver very well. So um, I'm going to do I'm going to do a chop here. I'm afraid. And we'll come back to that. And we'll do this, and then we'll do that, and we'll do that. Okay, just to get things. Now I can see what the pickups are. No wonder they sounded so good. Fender Custom Shops. Yes! <laughs> I'm only pleased because I can tell a good... I can clearly tell a good Fender pickup from a, something else. Oh, yeah. I'm pleased with that. I knew they were ex especially good. Yeah, I'm jealous. I want some custom shops in mine. Okay, so what I'm just doing here is I'm just giving myself a little bit of a, a platform to slice off uh, slice off these wooden sticks of doom. And I just want to protect the finish to make sure, just in case, that I don't accidentally slice them. Now I tend to go above the line, so I'm, I'm never cutting downwards, I'm always cutting upwards. Come along. Come along. Probably uh, could do with being lower, but you've got to go with what you've got, really. So, yeah. Uh, will my little, fabulous little... Now this one won't really go in, because it's... Yeah, I can't reach it, can we? No, see. So, next stage. I don't have a bendy knife, really. So the next stage is a bit of... Chop it off. Actually, you know what? We'll probably get a better bite with one of my fret cutter things. Let's chop that with this. Not not perfect. Let's have a feel. The trouble is with this is you end up sort of compressing it and bending it. Yeah, it's not really what I want. Damn. You can cut it back eventually, but you've got to be... Take your time with a handheld blade, which is never that good fun. Try it with a chisel. Ch chisel, yeah. So this is a bit of a fiddle. Um, as I say, it's difficult to cut it back. You know, the idea is, could you have, could I have cut the pieces to size to get them in? Honestly, not really. Um, nigh on impossible. Well, I have to say, if I get this baby finished tonight, I'll be chuffed. Because um, we've been going backwards a little bit. Okay, so the problem with this is you need a you need an incredibly sharp blade to be hand slicing this. So this is where I probably revert to a couple of new blades out of the tube, the blade containers, and of course it has to be we have to be dead flush when the time comes. What I'll do before I put any of this back together again, um, I'm going to just paint the little cavity hole at uh, the back, paint it black so it, it sort of doesn't stand out. Um, the thing about, thing about the shielding here, um, what I've learned, if I'm, if I'm at all right about it, um, is when you do shielding, you need to take some, to go to some length to make sure that it's um, the shielding is first of all continuous, so it all connects up electrically to itself. I can't reach this thing very well. Um, and then you have to um, make sure not only is all the foil or whatever you use continuous, then you have to be able to ground it all 
and make sure that grounding is continuous all the way through. Um, so what I see here, that there's no grounding. So this isn't really working as a shield. <laughs> so it's a bit of a fiddle, but while we're at it, before I put all this back together again, this is pain. How am I going to get this done? Probably could drill, dremel it off with a, well, what do you call it? Sanding drum, easier than doing it this way. This one, for some reason, seems really hard. <laughs> hey, Lloyd, this is not wanting to cut. Have I got just a crap blade here from the new set? Please help me. Maybe these are just rubbish. I bought them. These probably came from Amazon somewhere. Yeah, so the secret of making this thing work as a cage, as it's called, is to make sure that it's all continuous, which unless you've got the the type of copper insulation tape, or the copper tape which is um, has insulating glue, sorry, not insulating glue, uh, electric, conductive glue, it won't work. My god, this is incredibly hard wood. Uh, I have no choice. I have to do it this way. Uh, yeah, so you, you've got to you've got to get the um, copper tape that is got conductive glue. Otherwise, you'll just be laying one strip on top of another one, and it won't be continuous. You have to. Um, I'm really struggling to cut this. I'm going to have to use this, which is not really what I want to do, but. Yeah, it's going to be better than, even if the, the surface is a little bit crumpled, it's better than not being able to get it flush. I think I'd rather have get there than not get there. Um, yeah, so, uh, and I don't think a lot of people get that about the Faraday cage um, and its need for it to be electrically continuous. Because um, most of the guitars I see when they take the back off, there's no um, grounding wire ground that, that grounds the... Um, this might be, maybe it grounds out on this, that's the idea. Um, but, and it, so it could be grounded, but my concern would be if the tape isn't the special tape and it's not tested to be sure that it's continuous, um, then it might not be doing anything. And a lot of people, um, I know, by or I've seen by tape that isn't continuous and it's just it's the sort of stuff that they try and or use to keep slugs off the garden or something like that so it's uh, it's, it's a tricky one partly why I use the conductive paint because at least I know it's I can see that it's all continuous all right so with a bit of brute force here I'm getting down to as flush as I can nearly get um, also, if I'm not convinced this is touching the, um, the the metal shielding, if I'm not convinced it's touching out, I tend to put a, an extra grounding lug in um, just to be uh, uh, totally on the safe side. But that's just my overkill tendency. So here I'm just doing that as much as I can now to level this out. These blades are turning out not to be very sharp at all. Um, I'm not making a, this easy. <laughs> Sorry, it's taking so long. It's a very boring thing to watch, I know. Uh, if we don't get this smoothed out, then it's going to, again, the, tr the tremolo isn't going to sit comfortably on there. Right. So whatever it be, I have to use, even if I have to find some better quality knives from blades from before and hope that they will cut better. Yeah, look at that. I've got some crappy ones in that little pack, haven't I? These are cutting right away and these are a different brand. Note to self, bin that last lot. Okay, so again, when you 
when you fill and re-drill, you you have to take it down to flush, but you want, you've got to be quite careful not to go further and take off more finish at the same time. So target is flush, but no more than flush. Okay. So, let's get rid of all these funny little bits of glue and stuff. Right, so we've got our re-drilled, uh, drilled out holes. Um, mostly a bit of wax. The wax gets on here and sort of you know, makes a streak. Um, but we're Nearly. Which one was it? Oh no, I've lost which was the good one now. Let's just double check. It's a Friday night, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm in the workshop. What are you up to? Probably not Friday night where you are, but watching this. Well, it could be because I got the internet so powerful nowadays I could I could upload this as why well, just as soon as think about it okay so the beauty of this is is now we've got this uh, those done I can actually now put this back on here and for okay, that, that the wax is good but it enough streak everything up um, we'll put what's that glue yes Thank you. Um, put this back on here. Put the locating first one in. Change the thing. <laughs> um, well, okay. Let's let's do this. Let's get the holes drilled before I do the painting it black. And the painting black isn't really just isn't to be isn't for the sake of being. Um, conductive. It's more for the point of, um, uh, let's just get this right, it's more about just covering up the, uh, the colour. Okay, so the difficult bit, always a difficult bit on this, is getting any kind of centre line on this that's dependable. So. Wow, magnet is sticking to this neck because the truss rod underneath is massive, inverted commas, and magnetic. So what I'm going to do again is I'm going to get the famous laser beam, make my inverted commas fingers like Dr. Evil. Laser beam, and I'll line this up down the center of these here dots and into the middle point of that tremolo. Then that should give me is a chance to establish a bit of a centre line down the back here. <coughs> Stay put. Get a pencil. Mark the centre line where it goes by. Which will be there. And then we really need it marked over here. Right there. The pencil is not the very best device to mark something like this. Oh, I need to undo this again. Okay. So that's that, that's that, that's that. You can come off again, you can hang up again. So now we have a centre line. Now we have a pen, now we have a ruler. Let's mark the centre line here, like so. So as I'm doing this, so we can see what the right angles for the bridge should be. So, 
quick way of doing that in a minute. Let's get some more tape um, into play here for a minute. This green tape is great for this sort of marking up positioning stuff. Very, very handy. So I see that you've um, you put something in the bottom of here to try uh, protect it from grounding out, which is a good move too. Uh, here we are. So what I'll do to get me a get me a right angle. What I need mainly. Let's do it on here. We'll get a right angle. We'll use this to do the straight line. Place that there. Mm. Where's the where's the hole? Talk to me. <laughs> okay. There's the hole. There's the hole. Okay. There's a straight line. There's the hole. Make this on the straight line. Now, this is going to establish the the center line of the screws, but this may not be exactly what the darn thing wants. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. yeah, and then we go to here, and we establish the difference between there and there. Thirteen, thirteen. Okay. Yeah. So it's a yeah. Okay, that's not bad. That's pretty good on the center line versus the this bit here. So. If we go back and do this, oh no, let's do this first. Let's cut out the green stuff. Green stuff cut out. Um, ooh, that do I need to worry about that? That's right at the top, isn't it? No, we're out of we're out of reach of that. I'm not going to do any more thingying. So let's put this one in first. Now we've got a centre line to look at. Of course, you've got a bit of to and froing on here. Um, so that's the that's the left and righty side. There's a couple of mills which is important in the overall alignment. So let's just check something here. So that's where the original one sat. Oh, we've got another one. Yes, we must have. Okay, so this, let's just draw this line a bit further. Should be able to line this up dead on the center line again, coming out the front of here, get it between the saddles. And that should be our marker. Okay, so that looks to me like this is positioned dead in the center of the first one. And that the first one here is an extended one. All of them, except this bottom end one, are long ones, which allow this movement. But I need this to be dead in the centre there, which means my next one is going to be here. And it's this one is the critical one. Like that. So take that out. So getting this next one is absolutely vital um, and after that then I'm going to try and get the next ones in with the thing in place so we can be confident they're going in in the right place now it's time to tidy up soon 
This one's going to go down on that line there. Now it's the start point. Get ourselves a correct bit, which will be that one. And here we go. Right. So at this point, I'm going to take off. So you can see there's quite a lot of way inwards now, rebalancing this. That's looking good. So I put the first one back on. Oops. And now we we'll use the rest of them as center marks of the rest of them. So we get this one centered now. The, this is now, this end one here now is the real locator of all of them. Right, that's now, that's now straight on. Okay, so now I'm gonna draw all the way around. On each, oh, too much movement, it's gonna go it's going to be on the center line, isn't it? Hmm. That's interesting. So that's, we know that when the thing goes, it's going to be middle, so it's too much room, darn it. So I think the middle point is there. I think the middle point is there. I think the middle point is there. And I think the middle point is there. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. So, here's the bit that's tricky. Let's go, they're all forward a little bit, they're all back a little bit. Forward a little bit, back a bit, right. So I feel this is the center point. It's on the line, trust the line, make the mark. Trust the line, make the mark. There we go. Trust the line, make the mark. The line is a bit obscured, but trust it anyway. You can't quite see where the line is there. Make the mark. Okay. So, this is, I don't know how we're doing for videoing now. It's probably conked out. Yep. Holy cow. Oh, we're still running, but I'm on low power. Uh, go away with my thing. Low power, yes, quick, quick, plug in. Oh, sorry, this, see, this was never intended. Now I can't use this microphone if I plug it in. Cuts the sound, goes to the different mic, carries on filming. Oh, yeah, right. right, let's get this done. Oops, no more filming on that mic, okay. Come on, you. Come on, you. Come on, come on. Let's just clear you out. <sighs> so you notice this is doing this without waiting for the glue to dry. That's fine. And we're also going through here as well to the other side, but that's also fine. Right, let us put in, I'll tell you what, let us now get rid of paper. You can see it goes off now to a different place altogether, slightly sideways. Right, all the rubbish out there. Let us give this a quick rub down with a clean cloth. Okay, here we go. Actually, we're good, we're covered up, so we don't really need any paint to touch up at the front there. 
Okay, let's get them in. First and last, first. Let's get them in. On, back off. Back on, back off, right. On. Back off, fine. On, fine. Here we go. So that's now, is that giving us a little bit less travel? The road I travel. Yes, it has. You know why? Because it's now straight. Uh -huh. Right. Mm -mm. So we need to just balance up the clearance now. These um, tremolos would work basically on two. Uh, where was I going now? Where was it getting in the way? Uh, that was getting in the way. There, wasn't it? Too close to there. Right, so it's touching there. Bottom end, top end. That's where it's touching. Bottom end, top end, top end, bottom end. So it's touching there. So I should have done that in the first place. Right, let's change this out. You see, it's now we now become a, a big pile of tools on the fly. Probably should stop now and take a cup of tea break and call it quits for a bit. <laughs> Come on, you can do it, you can do it. Thank you. We'll go in there, and we'll go in there, and we'll go in there. The medium-sized one. Let's do that. Okay, here we go. There's a bit still there, and I thought we didn't need to move it, but we do. Just that a little tiny bit. I'm going to do a bit at the bottom on the this side as well. But it's almost there. That's the clearance we needed. Hope they're uh, still recording okay. And then the sound will have changed. 
changed, but hey. Okay, which bit was it? Uh, <coughs> there. <coughs> To a dentist, really, isn't it? Never seems to end. <laughs> Please, dentist, tell me it's coming to an end. Right, I think, and I'll do one more test. One more test, and then after that, when I'm happy that that's moving smoothly, then I will clean up. Uh, I'll do a little bit of conductive paint in that cavity. Just to tidy it. Feels good. Now see, even that one's slightly off. Do your best. That one wanders off. Come on, you. Get in there. Um, let's put, oops. Let's put, put the ones that are dead on that we know are positioned exactly right in first. See, that's why it really helps to have a machine because if you're if you're drilling with a machine you get these drill holes exactly right it's feeling good Committed. They kind of tolerate a bit of sideways movement, obviously, with these things, but they, they really don't like uh, the front and back out of the plane movement, otherwise it gets stiffened, stiffened up. It's feeling about right, so let's slack these off for a minute. Come back on. First one, down, back. Second one, down, back. Third one, down, back. Fourth one, down, back. Fifth one. Back off, back off. Okay, I think we got good movement there. Um, right, so we got a tiny little bit of um, black paint, or not black paint, wood showing here, um, which I'm gonna just put a couple of little dabs of paint on. Um, but first we'll take off the tremolo again and do the conductive paint. Get there in the end. Actually, you know what's probably easier? Instead of going with paint on this little bit, let's put we'll do a, a, a tiny bit of marker pen. That will probably do this quicker and easier than um, paint, which will mess about taking ages to dry. So let's have a, a look just on the front of this here. Soak it in. Yeah, not bad. And 
please don't show, but I'm just doing it for good measure. There you go. I think that's good. I'm going to now actually return this to its on position now, and we'll be done. And get on. Um, and I will finish this tonight. Because I said I would. And therefore I will. Okay, so... Um, I mean, okay, it's taken more time and it's taken an extra set of strings. But we've got a tusk nut on. We're going to have uh, a lovely playing guitar. So we might as well, while we're at it, make sure the bridge moves correctly. Because if it doesn't, then, you know, it's a waste of the, the money on the, on the Wilkinson because it's such a good bridge. I'm just hand tweaking these. So remember, do them up until the bridge lifts up at the back and then slack off. Even a you know, couple of quick turns, it doesn't matter. At this point, these screws, their only purpose is to just add a bit of holding power. The, you know, as long as, long as you get it to the point where they just begin to lift the back end and then back off, it, it's absolutely great that it's this loose. In fact, it's better that it's this loose than any other kind of fitting. Okay, that's great. That's good. I'm going to put on the um, put on the neck now, and then I will have a tidy up. And I think we ought to go off camera for a tidy up, followed by a bit of um, tea or something. I mean, you know, it's going to be a, a latish Friday evening at this rate, but it's important that I get this done right. Now, somewhere in here now with the other two screws. There they are. Right, we need that one. I always do the thing. Start with out your screwdriver ready. Is that supposed to do that? I've never seen it do that before. Right. You stay here, Baba. Come on. <laughs> I'm losing it now. Come on. Oh, my God. Oh. This has stopped, ceased to work the way it should, and it's now playing funny games. Right. We're on four. That's good. Fit it. Fit it. Fit it. Tighten it. Tighten it. Tighten it. Tighten it. That's good. So good. So good. Right. So I'll just flip this over for a minute. And we'll just put the screws back on to keep this all stiffened up and I put these from horizontal um, from diagonal to horizontal just because if I don't I know there'll be some people with OCD out there who will go oh, I can't stand you put them on diagonally somebody somewhere said once it's a crime to do that so you mustn't do it <laughs> so I put them on there's no real good argument arguable logic as to why okay better now mm, right what I'm going to need to do now is also clear a bit of welding no soldering space because I need to resolder this and get a new output from the jack to here um, this this has got a little bit of paper in the bottom I would use a bit of this myself just because it's easier um, but the difficulty is getting it to the shape 
that will go in there comfortably. So I sort of like to guess. Bin, 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 and come back and do the round bit at the back, sort of, around there, sort of like that. Total guesswork, but you know what, it's not that bad. Yay, <laughs> missed, gone off sideways. Right, go in, folded. No, no, this is going to get stuck in more. Stuck on everything. Right, that's better. In you go. A bit of black tape, Gorilla tape. So yeah, um, I, will, I will get myself. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give this a little polish because it's been a lot handled recently. Um, I'm going to clear up, prep the welding, soldering bench, and then I'm going to come back and we're going to solder this and then bring it back and string it and then it will be done. <sighs> oh, yeah, I forgot one thing. I said, let's get on and do the soldering, but then I forgot the, the thing I was going to do, which is uh, a little bit of a quick polish up thing. And then I need the cutters, I need the cutters, I need the blade, I've got the blade. Right. <sighs> Sorry, it's not the best view in the world. Right, I'm just going to give this a quick going over because I said it's got a lot of wow, beautiful late sunshine out there. Uh, had a lot of handling during us toing and froing with the bridge business, so it was nice to give it a bit of a, a bit of a clean over, a sort of tea cut before we lock it down. So what I'm going to do in terms of electronics. I'm just going to pick some new cable for the jack socket because it's not long enough and we're sort of stretching unhelpfully to try and get it connected up we just don't need that um, and we're gonna reconnect everything um, and yeah get the plate back on I'm so pleased that it turned out that to be custom shop pickups because I could tell oh yeah so I'm <laughs> constantly telling people that pickups are so subjective really that it's hard to not only to recognize you know or, or name something as being definitively good or bad or really you know being able to describe the tonal characteristics of something which is by definition of subjective experience so it's always always sort of saying well, I don't it's just my my taste and on this day and then at that time of day and you know with this mood and so on and then I went and bloody identified correctly the custom shop pickups ha huh. I must be a genius right I'm kidding right this is the um this is the wire that's going to go and ground the tremolo claw oh, sorry the bridge really um it's going to go to the tremolo claw so Got some solder on there. Had a quick clear up so I can get this done. After this, I've got a nut job to do, which is shouldn't be a problem. I forgot to switch on my. No, I didn't forget to switch it on. I forgot to turn on the power. Uh huh. Okay, so I'm going to use my. Going to use my, my my. Where's those things gone? My helping hands. You need helping hands. So sort of go somewhere like that. Sorry about the view. It's a bit late now to be trying to worry too much. Okay, so I'm going to redo this this socket, and it should be should stay in place. All right. Um, I, you've got sort of nice coiled wires there, which are cool, but they're not very long. So I'm going to re place them um, with these which I use all the time for the jack socket it gives me a better run and some some extra um, the, the idea of the coiled two wires is supposed to be that it helps to shield the cores of each um, from 
electromagnetic or radio interference or whichever is the correct term. So what we've got, we've got neck, middle, custom shop, and I don't know quite what the uh, bottom one is, but all together they sound very good. Okay. I'm just whizzing through here, pulling the cover off the cable, getting them lined up ready for. Is it going to be enough, long enough? Do you know what? I'm not sure it is. Maybe it isn't. No, oh, it's got to come out of this one. Oh, do you know what? I probably cut that too short. That's, that's not faff about. It'd be a pain to get there and find out it's too short and have to do it again. So, I'm pretty confident now we've got the tremolo as good as it's going to be because we've got it correctly positioned, um, straightened out, and as, as importantly, I've cleared out a bit more of the obstructions, which is quite good because we didn't, <clears throat> we've got, I could do that without having to route out any major cavity changes. So just a bit of work with the Dremel. Um, so that's there and repositioned the filled and redrilled to reposition the uh, tremolo screws and just really emphasizing the importance of getting those right in constructing a strap because it's absolutely depressing, demoralizing actually when you put in all this hard work into making a, a decent strap and then you come to find that when it comes to it the bridge just is sticky and stiff and you know you paid 40 quid for the Wilkinson tremolo and um, and yeah it's just not going to perform for you and you end up locking it down and sort of go well okay <laughs> write it off as a good try write it off to experience um and it's a shame to have to do that so i think it's worth fighting for even if it means filling some original holes and redrilling some new ones so i'm just going to load this a little bit extra to give us a chance to get it onto the pot okay so our jack socket i'm just going to shorten this and i'm going to shorten that and at one end let's let's clean up this first this is not going to want to come out without burning my finger shoulder okay so one of the things I know this, this may sound like teaching you to suck eggs and I'm sure ah, Christ it's still hot I'm sure you um, would never get caught out like this but one of the things that I found depressingly commonplace for me was getting caught by the um, getting this this part 50% chance of the wrong wrong way around so if you think about it you've only got one chance to uh, get it right and I kept getting it wrong for some reason I would go to myself okay hot to the hot da, 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 and then go through try and do all the rest of the guitar wire it all up figure out find something wasn't working come back to it and only after hours of replacing everything else decide sort of just a last ditch to check the uh, the um, jack socket and see just in case and then to discover oh this one come out this is feathering um then to discover that uh, in fact it was the wrong way around and i could never believe it because it's not that bloody hard a thing to do is it you only got 50 percent chance of getting it right and wrong but i'd get it wrong and uh and then I would really not check it until the final go of everything because it's sort of been out of sight, out of mind-ish. Um, and then I would 
finally go, oh, could I have made that mistake again? And I'd go and find out that indeed I had. Right. Now we can get this through. Thank you. I wish I had a hanger up there for my soldering iron, but I don't. Okay. Uh, this to the ground point. Yes, you pleasey. Not brilliant, but they will do. They will be strong. Strong. One. The hot bit done. Well, I look forward to getting this off to you on m m Monday. I think I've got stuff happening all over. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yep, get it off to you on Monday in in the post. Or off with the courier, I should say. We good? <sighs> we good. Right. Trim back the excess bits. Thank you and thanking you. Thank you. Okay, so back up through there. Have I done it the hard way? I probably have, you know. What, 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 where, where, what? Oh, I've got to go uphill. That's, shouldn't have done it that way. That's probably impossible. I should have gone the other way. Come on, up you come. Thank you. In you go. Thank you too. Right, basically, two things to reconnect with a couple of things. Anyways, thank you for that. A um, couple of things to disconnect first. I don't know what you can see there. It's all in the way. Everything's a bloody mess. What are you seeing? What can you see? You're going to see the guitar and think, no, yeah, maybe no, that's no good. Something like that. Ah, uh, sorry. Right, let's get rid of this one straight off there. This one out of there. Um, Again, oh no, keep keep it for spare wire. Um, no spare wire. Bare wire is what I'm talking about. Right, let's bring this up here. Let's bring this into play. So here we've got, I'll change the view, here we've got, sort of see, and this one comes through here, like so, thank you for holding on there for a minute. I'm going to drag this back. This is where I, I slightly regret this soldering iron not being a bit fiercer than it is because it needs a lot more heat at this stage for sticking things to pot tops than it seems to have and it gets, takes forever. Get on there. You transfer much more heat. I may have to I may have to revert to my uh, the um, impossible thermonuclear draper, which is this beastie here. What would I take out instead? Who knows? What's this? Ba -bam. That was something else. Right. Um, so this is that. I'm going to just lift that up there a minute. And then we're going to hook this to there, for example. But I'll wait until I've got the, the thermonuclear device, which will take a while to heat up. But when it does, it just does things much easier. So let me, while you're looking at that, let me get the screwdriver, the screws for the scratch plate and the pick guard, and we'll be ready to go. Heat 
Oh, draper, 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 don't, don't do that. Well, I just put it in, I put it in there and it doesn't appear to be heating up. <laughs> what is going on? Yeah, it is very slowly though. As you get out of the way, it's nice you'll get melted. That's better. Right, let us attach this first of all. Those two done. Uh, right, bit of bit of extra. So, mm, you can go on there. Ooh, that's not good. So that's not even. Let's see. That's just come apart. So we'll take care of that. Mm. Double plus, not good. Right, let's just. Do this one first. Come along. That's that one. That one on the top of there. Cut this spare one off there. Join that one to that one with some extra, loads of extra goo. We heating up? We are heating up. Slowly but surely. All right, and then we'll put that over, flip it over, do it back up, then we'll be into, um, what are these anyway? Who made that one? Who made that one? Don't know, but those two sound good. That's my thing, is if you get the right um, neck pickup, I think you're in a good you're in a good place really. Can't go wrong. Okay. Nearly there, nearly there. Cross A the fingers. Let's see if the super hot thing's gonna do us a favour. Oh I suppose I'll need this as well, won't I? It's kind of for run out this um it's like a club foot now this bleeding draper thing but it the good thing is it is it's hot enough to put well not quite yet but it will be hot enough to stick this down Just, it's pretty lousy until you get this thing enough heat transfer. Um, this one is taking quite some time. Until you get it right, it just doesn't want to do it. Now here, I'm trying to get all of these together in one big ground, common ground blob, you might call it. Ugh. Come on. Get on there, get on up there. You go there, and you go here. This is really <laughs> struggling to do what I want. Stay on there, please, uh, for the twentieth time. It's just refusing to work. <laughs> please. 
please heat up and sit down where you're supposed to sit down for goodness sakes right that's better finally gets to the right temperature <laughs> Right, that's done, that's done. This needs to go on here, and then we are done. Good, that one off. Ta -da. Everybody happy. Everybody's here you go, drop that down gently under there first. Get that the wrong way around. On there, on there, on there. Ah, ha! Now, there's a little something we still didn't anticipate. Now this is in the right place, we say. Now this needs a tiny bit of adjustment. can't win can you you really can't win you really 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 can't win around the corner of there. If I had my way, I'd like to flee them into shape. But my hands were tied, for bleeding nuts and artists, let him get away with murder. Let me hammer him today. feels good looks good that is going to go in place there that's going to go in place there i think everything is in the right place but i could be very wrong <coughs> <coughs> This um, scratch plate uh, is now looks slightly off, but the um, the bridge is on the next center line, whereas this isn't. Oh, the scratch plate, I don't think it is. But we'll go with perpendicular to the neck if at all possible. Please. isn't it that you you only get to the bit where you discover oh, please where you discover there's a potential um thank you that's sticking in there you discover a potential overlap when you get to the very last bit and everything's in place and then you go oh wait a minute this doesn't quite meet or oh no that's getting in the way of that it's so infuriating Come this 
way. Good, right, let's get this show on the road. We've got to trust everything before we go ahead and put springs on. So I'm going to check that the pickups are working and that nothing came disconnected during the handling of the duct plate just now because it's a possibility. And then it's very depressing to think you've got it all done, put it all together, and hey presto, it doesn't work at all. So, you know, a bit of extra baffling about this may be. We get this, we plug it in, we switch it on. We tap the doofers. Oh, that doesn't help. Right up there. Oh, well, wow. turn up, tap up, up, everything up. Okay. Well, how about that? So look at that, what's going on here? Please. So I told you, you do that and you figure out nothing's working and you start again. Uh, this is... Uh, sent to try us. Now, what I don't know is what this, um, uh, oh, that's a switch on for the, I know what that is, a switch on for the, switch in for the bridge, isn't it? So what I don't know is if anything else has now come apart. So we have only the neck, prop, neck working, I think. I think, wasn't it? That's not good. So there's something about the switch Lever switch come undone. <sighs> Seriously, could you do without this? Right, we're uh, caught with anchor, uh, anchor thingy, you know what I mean? We've got output, um, we've got, okay, well that, for all I know, that could be touching out on there. That's the other concern I would have straight away, <sighs> is the switch, it's a tall switch. And if that even so much as touches out at the bottom, up there, then you won't get anything at all. So we don't know if it is or if it isn't. So sorry about this. That's going in there. And I know it doesn't really want to work like this. And that's just going to have to insulate it the best it can. Um, so we've got, uh, right, so that was not working. So there's no reason, nothing else here is broken that should have stopped that working at all. Um, that's working, that's connected to that, that's connected, that's good, that's grounded to there. <sighs> right, let's try one more time. With this out of the... On. Yep. Okay, so that was it grounding out. So that's the risk, an absolute risk when you when you copper shield things and you use a tall switch. The problem you've got is when you put this back in, you're ever so likely to ground out your teeth, your lugs on your lever switch uh, on the shielding. So now I'm going to try this again in position. Okay. Something wrong with the wiring here.
maybe. That was weird. It was like all three were on or something. Well, it's working as as it's intended to. I don't know exactly what you had done there, but I'm afraid I'm not going to worry myself about that aspect of it. Um, as long as it plays all three pickups, then the logic to how it's been done is not quite my zone to worry too much about. But that's so that that bit there you saw where it wouldn't play anything. That's because the the uh, switch lugs were just shutting, shorting out. That means when you put them in, they must have been very close to it, and just taking them out and putting them back in has caused them to just touch the the copper. It only has to be the tiniest touch, and it's gone. So, Again, I'll check it again now when this is nailed down because uh, it may also have done the same. And actually, when it comes to it, if that continues to happen, then my recommendation is you just get, you either shield it, um, you know, isolate it off in a way that you're confident it's isolated, or you just take out the, the shielding because it's, in a sense, it's causing more trouble than it's probably saving you. Um, Okay, so this is the whole thing together. One more try. Okay, we're good. Right, let's move it and groove it. You can go off, uh, you can go off, you can go off. You are off already. Ooh. Let's take the arm oh, and the tip, switch tip, which came off unbidden. Uh, oh geez. Sorry, I've got you connected to the power over there. <sighs> Just momentarily. I don't, I'm not even using that one, am I? Holy Three mackerels. Things, things can only get better. Didn't stop and have a break, but I just carried on. Right. Still charging. You go there. You get out of the way. Still charging. We're coming towards the end game. Uh, if I had to stop this now, and I'll put on the two together. Hold on. Right, let's get some stringers on this, and we are good to go. Hoorah! Oh well, uh, yeah, we know it plays. That's good. Um, we haven't felt the tremolo, but we've done everything we can to make sure it will play. Everything within my power is what I mean. Um, and if it doesn't, well, it's no, it's gonna be no worse than it was, but I think, I think it should improve it. And what we wanted was we wanted it to sit square and flat, and we wanted it then to just go a down only setting. So I've got absolutely, <laughs> I've got nowhere compared to my to-do list. Um, I had complete Andy's parts caster and I have 30 minutes written down on my to-do list. What are we now? We're coming up on 10 o'clock or something? 9 o'clock, 9.30? No, I don't know what we are, but it's uh, it's taken four hours nearly. Hmm. Or something like that. Every time we came here, five. Where's that interest? We came here at five. It's now half nine. Four and a half hours, so about four hours. Because so about half an hour I did some tidying up and messing about. But four hours. So my it's it's my 30 minutes to finish off, put the strings on, put the tuners on, put the strings on and head for the hills. It's turned into four hours of re renovation, unfortunately. So just a, one of those things, you can never predict it. Uh, it's, and it's, it's almost always going to be more than less. Right, so I'm going to do my D and G first. Let's go up this end again, just for, oh, crying out loud. Sorry, I keep forgetting that I'm tied to the battery because this is not charged. Just mm. doing my head in, actually. <laughs> uh, let's do the D. To do the D. 
Do the dog. Not the donkey. Do the dog. Right, so this is where we were three and three quarter hours ago, I think. Oh yeah, and a set of strings as well. Down the tubes. Blimey. Oh, I'm back to front. I cannot believe this. I've done this again. Ah. Seriously, seriously. Oh, crying out loud. Please, Lordy, save me. Two of these strings back to front. <laughs> What's going on here? Right, well, we're now where we were four hours ago, nearly, possibly, almost. Okay, whiz, whiz, whiz. Goes get clippers. How come nothing goes the way you want it to? Mm -hmm. It's because I can't even get that through the hole. What the flying Scotsman is wrong with me? This is uh, now. I suspect this may well give up the ghost. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> that got caught down at the base. Brilliant, and gave me an extra couple of mils of windings which is exactly what I needed since I had crimped the first lot. Well that was actually the only good bit of luck I've had today. Look at that! I was worried about that because I'd already bent that round the, the D post. But it caught on the back of the block and as a result it released its extra bit of length and that got me over the crimped bit. So we got through without a problem. Yes, oh yes. <laughs> this is a small thing to be pleased about, but I am strangely pleased about it. Right. Again, that one got caught as well. I still can't get over the fact that that viewer spotted that I'd ground down the end of my uh, spring winder. And a brilliant piece of observation. And I'd forgotten, of course, that I had. And of course, I know why I had, because it's far too easy to end up sending, putting little circles on somebody's lovely new headstock. And that's just, look, I'm missing the holes. What the hell is wrong with me? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really depressing thing to do. You know, somebody's got a nice new guitar and you're doing your best to wind the strings on and before you know it, you put some little swirls on there. And it's all because of this sharp, silly tuning device. So I was determined not to get caught like that again. And at last, the E string. Now we've got the intonation right, which is good. The action's good. Don't need to change anything. So this really is pretty much the last, the last tango. And I think if I can, tonight now, if I can just get the other guitar nut done, I will be sort of vaguely on track, short of a couple of to-do list items, which is just how it's gonna have to be. <laughs> real life intervenes. Okay, so I'm going to do a bit of a stretch, a bit of a stretch. All right, 
So you saw me doing the stretching thing before, so I'm not really going to probably go into it in too much detail, but... Now the key thing here now, oh yeah. Beautiful. Oh man, I am happy. <laughs> Disproportionately, inordinately happy. Look how smooth and slick that baby is there. about right as well um, at, at rest probably a tiny millimeter or two we can clamp it down a little bit more than that two turns on each uh, thingy yep fab right ladies and gentlemen I am done. Andy and um, Zach in particular, I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, kind of getting frustrated at certain points in that. It's just real life, you know. Um, I can't leave something incomplete if it's not, you know, ideal. Oh, what I could do is that I could do with a tiny bit of a tweak on the neck on this. Hold on a sec. See more tweaks. Um, can't leave things. Uh, they need a slight adjustment so that's my sort of nature um, so I have to get it right and hence making sure I get that tremolo right so hopefully you can see that it's what it comes down to is how important uh, how important it is with regard to um, let's see if I can get this to press press down in the direction I want it to go which is that way but I need to get to there um yeah you can see how how important it is to can I get that down how important it is to get it right here we are Bring these up yeah I think the, yeah, the important thing is the straightness of the tremolo was really, really critical. Um, and also, of course, having the extra bit of movement room, which the, the paint on the other, on the inside of that cavity was preventing me from doing. It was getting in the way. So um, I've just done a little bit of adjustment to the alignment of the strings and then a final hand tighten here so it stays where it's put. again quickly but hooray
Right, that's it. Call time on it. The Dave Gilmore style strap um, tweaked and sort of recovered from um, where it was. I'll keep that, that's my tremolo arm, but it's set up now, ready to go down, tremolo only. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's playing and sounding great. So whew, there we go. Um, thanks for watching.